Hey, hey, this is Cedric Youngleman, your host of the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. This episode with Michael Dunworth about mathematics, cryptography, and how Bitcoin is time traveling energy is brought to you by River, the financial institution built for all time. Head over to River for zero fees on recurring orders. DCA with no fees. All Bitcoin is backed one to one in multi sig cold storage. Your Bitcoin is your Bitcoin to withdraw in full at any time. River built and owns their own infrastructure. River has U.S. phone customer support. This is where the Bitcoiners are going for a new standard in Bitcoin. Buy and build your Bitcoin wealth with a Bitcoin-focused company that has been built for generations. Use the link in the show notes to sign up and get $5 in Bitcoin when you get started today. In this remarkable rip, Michael Dunworth explores why people are like private keys, how optimism is pretty cheap these days, why fiat is terminally ill, and how we've never had a canvas as expressive as Bitcoin. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Michael as much as I did. What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Michael Dunworth is an entrepreneur focused on mathematics, cryptography, thermodynamics, and Bitcoin. He is the co-founder of Wire Payments and Peter Dunworth's little brother. Michael Dunworth, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. I'm super excited to get into it. Um, I, I can't wait to kind of hear a little bit more about your backstory, actually. If you yeah. might, you know, maybe let's just start out with uh, why did you move to San Francisco and when was that? Yep. All right. Easy. I can give you the rundown. Um, worked in finance. I was working at a software company that does basically portfolio management. If you've got a financial planner and they're trying to reweight portfolios and things like that, it was software for financial planners. Um, I did a startup at nighttime. It was like a restaurant booking system, similar to like a Groupon style platform, you know, those, uh, you know, Groupon daily deal stuff. Um, but we had a bit of a twist on it. Um, and anyway, long story short, we built that up and sold it to a company called timeout.com in Sydney. Just like it wasn't a big transaction. We just handed them the assets and stuff, but it gave us a flavor of building something. And then I moved to San Francisco uh, in 2013 and met my co-founder, Yanni, on a bunk bed. So I moved into a hacker house. It was like something out of Silicon Valley, the show. There's hacker houses. Hacker houses basically is where some dude has rented this massive place for like four grand a month. He stuffs it full of bunk beds, puts those bunk beds on Airbnb for a thousand bucks a month. And you got 12 people living in a three bathroom house. And this dude's making a killing. But the energy is there. It's exactly what you want. So if you're an entrepreneur and you've crossed the country, like you've crossed the world to go to this place, you know, it's a 14 hour flight, one way ticket. I was like, this is perfect. I'm right in the heart of the, like the belly of the beast now. This is fucking awesome. And so if that's the case, then I was like, all right, sweet. Um, you know, actors go to Hollywood, nerds go to San Francisco. So yes, you can, if you're in London, London or, you know, wherever, if you're in Denmark, you can be an actor. Sure. You can be an entrepreneur there. Sure. But the place to go, if you want to prove yourself against the best would be to Hollywood, right? Uh, you'd be the biggest actor there. Um, the same thing with nerds. Nerds go to San Francisco because that's where, you know, Every startup has a 99% chance of failure. If you can give yourself a 99.1% or 98.9% chance of failure, which is 0.1% different, you may as well. And so that's why I went to San Francisco. It just seemed like the, the birthplace of everything. It doesn't seem like that now. It does. I left there maybe, you know, just in the middle of COVID. And it definitely doesn't feel like it was. The essence has kind of been stripped out of it. You know, a lot of the stuff from all the riots and all the you know, just the gnarliness of the drugs and everything like that in San Fran at the moment, it's a bit beaten up. So that's probably been sucked a lot of the air out of the room, but I built, I built a company called Wire, W-Y-R-E, and we specialized in technical infrastructure and exchanging assets for exchanges. Basically, we were sort of like behind the scenes of a lot of exchanges, we would be the, the plumbing system that gets them going. So creating wallets, buying, selling coins, uh, you know, verification. We had to do all that shit. 
Long story short, we thought when we did that, we had to go and get all these licenses as a fintech company. Mm. And we thought, oh, shit, that's really difficult. Mm. Everyone's going to take four years to do this. We may as well productize that, which means compliant fiat on and off ramps or whatever it was at the time, and give that to developers because that way the whole industry can move faster. If the developers have got tools or you can keep it as a competitive moat and be like, eh, fuck everyone, make them wait four years and do the same thing. But I don't think we've got four years. Like this is such a beautiful moment in history where you've got this chance to innovate on this really exciting tech. You've got to all play as a team, you know, like we use software that's open source software to create our wallets and stuff. I didn't build it. I haven't checked it. I haven't said thank you to the dude that made it. I don't know who he is, but all I know is it works. And thank you for the work that you've done wherever you are. But that's how it is a cooperation environment, let's say, especially with fintech. Because as you're building a fintech company and financial technology, as you're building a fintech company, you realize you can't be good or it's so much red tape and just heavy lifting that you can't be good at everything. So you can't be really good at verifying customers and then also be really good at international payments and then also be really good at domestic payments. So everyone sort of is cooperating, but also competition. So cooperation, frenemies, whatever term you want to give it. Um, But you learn a lot. And I learned so much, you know, scaling a company from $0 in payment volume up to, you know, $25 billion in payment volume, you learn a lot along the way, the good, the bad, the ugly. And I, I, I feel very privileged. I feel very fortunate that my journey has granted me the full spectrum of everything, which is all the shit, like the stuff that you'd put pins in your eyes if it ever happened to you again, and then all the exciting moments, you know? So I got to experience all those exciting moments, but also the really shit ones. And the really shit ones are really, pardon me the language, but the really bad ones are really good because that's where you learn. I promise you that is like, if you're looking like, if you're a character in a video game and you're going to try and find more life to like charge your health bar up after fighting a bad guy, Like whatever it is, that root that you pull out of the ground and eat, that is what losing is. Being shit at stuff, failing at stuff, losing at stuff, chalk, chalk, chalk all that up, you got experience. Now, if you're arrogant and egotistical, you won't take away the lessons from your losses. You'll say, oh, I was hard done by, oh, that shouldn't have happened. Sure, maybe it shouldn't have, maybe it hadn't, maybe it wouldn't. But the universe is trying to make something happen. You just got to follow suit. And so as we start looking at things, in if you always extract the silver lining out of something. So if I always have a negative scenario, but I guarantee you I can always find a silver lining from that, then all I'm doing is accumulating positive scenarios because it means you're going to find something positive and negative anyway. And I used to say this to my team and they used to always laugh at me. They're like, dude, uh, you know, something terrible would happen where it's like, oh no, our servers are offline. And I'm like, okay, this is actually not bad. This is good. Here's why. And they'll be like, oh my God, stop finding the silver lining. But I am quite optimistic. I like to be optimistic. I think it's like free, like optimistic, being opt- being positive and optimistic is free. So it's like, that's right in my price range. I'll take that. You know, like with inflation coming around as well, like I've said this before, but it's true. Like I like doing free shit now. I like walking. I don't like driving my car. It's bad for my health. It's like, it's makes, it's not giving me any health benefits and it's costing me money. So I'm like, I feel stupid that I'll be honest, like just between you and I, I feel like a moron when I'm doing stuff that people know, like if they know it's stupid, Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I know it's stupid. So anyway, so a bit of background about me, I'm an entrepreneur and I built and scaled a payments company in the Bitcoin space and in this industry, Um, you know, from zero to sort of, I think we topped out at getting seven and a half million users to buy their first cryptocurrency. And we've got 1 million people that have put their currency into cold storage. I think those are the numbers. I haven't seen them yet. But Wire as a company, we grew and scaled um, very big. And then we recently, the market took turmoil last year. And, you know, we just had a difficult time raising. We had to take the decision to return everyone's money and try and give all the customers money back and then wind the company down. So um, that is... For an entrepreneur, like, you know, you work 100 hours a second, you eat, sleep and breathing something for eight to 10 years of your life. But, you know, it's even like people say to me, oh, aren't you bummed that the company's closed now? And it's like, well, I mean, I am bummed for the investors. And our, and when I say investor, anyone that has given something to the company, customer, they've given their time or their trust to us. 
investors they've given their money or team members they've given their time and money sometimes and so you feel bummed that they didn't get the the big victory and stuff like that but as an individual i feel very blessed because there's not many individuals in the world that have been able to scale a company from zero to 25 billion or seven and a half million users and then lose it all and be able to talk about it and and extract insight from what that feels like and so i get to work with younger kids than me and they're like, oh, Mike, were you really bummed out? that Because it was like, you know, we sold the company for one and a half billion and there was all this hype and all this stuff. But, you know, as an entrepreneur, you get used to managing your expectations and you have to, because if you don't, you'll get very emotional and very unstable very quickly because it is a high risk environment where you are, there's a lot of known unknowns. And when there's known unknowns, it becomes very, you need to be very precarious in how you take each step because you obviously don't know if this one, you know, if this step you step on is going to be hollow and fall through it or whatever. So that whole journey has been amazing. And through that, it gave me a, such a, I, I got to work with a brilliant team of people that taught me so much about security and systems understanding and just what it takes. Like, one thing we forget, Cedric, is like we're all building products in this space and everyone's having fun and stuff. This is people's money and money is the top priority next to food, water, shelter and oxygen. And we almost get all of those for free, nearly, not literally. And now people are starving. I understand that. But in first world countries, there's a lot of programs and support. So now money is basically the top priority for us every day when we wake up. It's like the filter on life that we didn't choose to have. So I find like uh, learning a lot about this experience about, you know, what's good about money, what's bad about money, what, you know, do you need money? Do you not need money? How much money do you need? All these lessons of good, bad and ugly. But um, yeah, I feel very fortunate to have taken a lot of those lessons on or tried to as best as I can. Obviously, there's a lot of things I'm probably still banging my head against the wall over. But yeah, it's given me a newfound appreciation for, you know, just building and scaling systems. And obviously, as the difficulties that we had scaling a distributed system, uh, it was really, it was hard. And I just think scaling security is really hard. And I realized that was sort of the takeaway from that whole journey of wire was respect security above all else. And, and, you know, I realized that after hearing people get hacked, after being hacked myself, SIM swapped, all that stuff, you realize that you don't have anything if you don't have security. And that's why Bitcoin is so strong because it's unbreakable and its security policy is tremendously strong. Like, like if we made this into, if Bitcoin was a physical machine, it would look like alien, like some alien craft. It's that big, it's that strong, it is that resilient, it's that persistent. And so now after taking away all these things, I was like, well, shit, that's really cool. I want to just basically focus on that. And I noticed like, you know, in security, the focus is always on cryptography and stuff like that. And so I was like, oh, cool. Well, what is, if Bitcoin is dependent on cryptography or security is dependent on cryptography, then what's cryptography dependent on? You know, the don't trust verify kind of thing. It's sort of like, okay, well, what's he dependent on? He's dependent on prime numbers. And I'm like, okay, well, what are they dependent on? Prime numbers make up the kind of the, they're the recipe, sort of the, the oatmeal and honey for your breakfast and breakfast is cryptography. Prime numbers are the ingredients you're putting into your cereal bowl. Um, and so I just found that really interesting. And then now I've been really lucky to just sort of share some exciting stuff that I feel like is really interesting, which is to do with Bitcoin. You know, we, we've got a ledger that can't break. We have the ability to shoot a comet out of the sky that's on its way to blow the earth up. We have the ability to dis disarm people, to disarm weapons, to control the weather, but we can't stop Bitcoin. And so if we can't stop Bitcoin, then that means that I can put a note on there for someone to read in the future. So if I carved, let's say Mount Rushmore, right? Mount Rushmore is likely going to be viewed by people in 100 years. Unless someone damages it or has an intentional reason to tarnish it, the rock's not going to decay that much. People will be still be able to read it because it's set in stone. The proof of work was so heavy. The work that it required requires so much work for nature to undo. And this is where it is. It's a battle of our work versus nature's work. And so, you know, you see these, basically what I'm saying is with the privilege of having a unified ledger, it's sort of like saying we've got an Excel spreadsheet that every single person on the planet will have on their computer. Do you want to put a message on it for everyone in the future? And you go, yeah. Fuck it. I will actually put a message. I'll tell them hi. Hope everything's going great and uh, don't kill each other. 
But that's what the Bitcoin blockchain is. Every person, whether we like it or not, and I don't say this as the biggest Bitcoin fan in the world. There are much more diehards than me. I think Bitcoin's really cool from an energy lens. Because I, I think money, we only have money, CJ, I, as far as I understand, is because we can't bottle up energy and hand it around to each other. Money is kind of like this proxy for energy, right? So we only have money because we don't have infinite energy. Uh, if you find that loop, it's sort of like, well, we need money because we have to measure it because we only measure it because we don't have infinite amounts of it. So because we think in scarce terms, we get really nervous and we like, well, hey, you better pay me back for that because I don't want to waste this because we don't have much more of it or we don't have an infinite amount. But as we start realizing, like, you know, imagine if someone 200 years ago stumbled across a humongous amount of gold and they go, well, everyone's going to like gold in the future because it's scarce. Like we know how hard it was to find this gold. Maybe they might get better at finding it, but they're not going to be able to absolutely find all of it instantly. They've got to work because they have to dig up the earth. And so I was thinking the same thing. I was like, well, 200 years ago to be mad if someone put a big golden nugget, like the size of a house in the middle of Australia with a big sign on it saying, hey, Mike, Here's heaps of gold. It's buried under, you know, it buried under this X marks the spot. That's basically what we've done on the Bitcoin blockchain where I've locked. So in the Bitcoin blockchain, Peter Todd developed a thing called BIP65, and that's to create a time locked address. What it is, it's like creating a special treasure chest. This treasure chest can only get opened once the Bitcoin block height has passed a certain height. So it's sort of like saying, you're like a time lock safe, you know, in pubs and clubs, they have a thing, oh, the robber comes in with a gun to their head. Sorry, man, it's got five minutes until it opens. And that's a safety precaution. So this time lock coin is locked until the year 2136. And it's half a Bitcoin. So at that time, yeah. So basically, if you lock coins in the future, it's only going to get more expensive. So because we don't want it to get more expensive, like as Bitcoin's price appreciates, one sat becomes more and more valuable, right? If Bitcoin price keeps going up. So I'm like, well, shit, if I'm going to donate energy to the future, lock coins into the future in this time locked address, this remember this magic treasure chest, it opens in 120 years. And in it is... 50 million times the block reward. So just think about that. Imagine a Bitcoin miner today got information that there is a specific way to mine a block today that is going to give them much, much, much more Bitcoins or whatever. They'd probably start looking at it and being like, well, how many Bitcoins am I getting? So right now, the op if you got, if there was a 3 million Bitcoin block, right? So it's six Bitcoins now. Imagine it was 3 million. Every person would drop everything they're doing and everyone would figure out how to turn their old miners on and start mining together, pool mining. I just want a cut of that cream, whatever it is. And so that's the idea is like, if we have a persistent energy ledger, we can lock energy on that ledger forever. And so if I give the private key to people, I say, hey, I'm going to lock this treasure chest. I'm the one with the key to the treasure chest. But if I photocopy that key and give it to everyone and I say, hey, guys, this magic treasure chest is going to open in 120 years. I'm not going to be here for it, but can someone make sure that they are, whether that's their kids, their grandkids or their grandkids, grandkids, I don't know. But the idea is that the carrot is so big that it's worth humanity preserving this private key for generations so that in the future, we have 50 million times the block reward worth of energy. And so what does that do for them? Uh, well, that means that's almost a huge carrot for Bitcoin miners. A lot of the talk and the discussion about, oh, what are we going to do when the reward cycle runs out? And oh, there's transaction fees. Well, look, Bitcoin is a closed loop system. You can't send your Bitcoins outside of Bitcoin. So whatever happens, all the coins are going to be on the network then. And so if I'm willing to throw some coins forward just as a, hey, like it's not, it's, it's a lot of money, but it's not relative to that. It's like pound bang for your buck it's astronomical like it's half a bitcoin to us which is tremendous but to them half a bitcoin in a hundred years is like like blow up that's like a thousand nuclear warheads worth of energy or 10 trillion of them like it's like a black hole worth of energy so it's like i thought that would be really interesting just as a thought experiment was well if what what does happen then if we lock these coins and if this thing is the be all and end all and it's going to suck in all the value of humanity and we've got the ability to donate those coins to any time we want, then that becomes very interesting to me because now it's sort of like, well, 
I don't know. It just almost like the motivation for a Bitcoin miner. If I was a Bitcoin miner today and they said, oh yeah, the block, the block rewards six Bitcoins, but in five years, it's going to be a million Bitcoins per, per block for a whole year. You'd be like, I am going to figure out how to start Bitcoin mining. I'm, I know I am. And that that's not because you're keen on Bitcoin. It's because you know value when you see it. That's arbitrage. That is not normal. And that's right. way more than it should be. So you, with the foresight and the intelligence that you have as a human being, you'll be able to see that and predict that. So the network activity should change before the event, just like the network activity leading up to an event should be anticipatory or anticipating some event. So if you've locked lots of coins, let's call it 40 years into the future, and everyone knows that, then 38 years or 36 years into the future, you should start seeing some, you know, some new mining rigs starting to turn on and get ready for it. So it was just a thought experiment about what could that do? Could it add value to humanity? Could it take away value from humanity? We don't know, but we've never had a canvas as expressive as Bitcoin. And I know that counterintuitively, people think that Bitcoin's not very expressive. Oh, what can you do with it? You can only send and receive money. It's like, yes, but I know that this will last for the past, present, and future. So it's not about me anymore. It's about what is this canvas going to say to people about this canvas is like a snapshot of humanity. What is it going to tell the future about us today? So the people, because we look back through Wikipedia, you've watched war documentaries, you've seen that random dude smoking a cig in the trenches or whatever. We've all seen it, but media wasn't rich then, like as in there was no rich media. So we don't know what Einstein's voice sounds like. We don't know what Tesla's voice, like we could find it, but it's not totally common sense. We all know what Joe Rogan's voice sounds like. We all know what Elon Musk's voice sounds like, Donald Trump's. Now, the people in the future looking back, think about how much we've digitized of ourselves, Sci like everything, like every person, every personal, whether you're celebrity or not celebrity, everyone is digitizing themselves. So the future, people that are looking through a digital lens can look back on us and understand us with a lot more clarity. They can read all the things we said, all the thoughts we had, all this stuff. So they'll be able to, we have a problem where we can't talk to Einstein. We, we, it'd be great to be able to talk to Einstein and Tesla because they had such, you know, brilliance, but we can't. And we can only understand them through their writings. That's why you have archaeologists that are trying to understand how are people, they're trying to empathize with how people are thinking. Because if I can understand the framework of how you think, I can probably understand the decisions that you're going to make, whether these are mathematical choices, whether these are engineering design choices. You know, Alan Turing would have made different design choices than some other engineer. And those are usually, with artists, they usually have these kind of tells in a way, which is sort of their idiosync idiosyncrasies or whatever it is, the nuance, like that, that nuance. Mm. So... Anyway, I know I've been rambling a lot, but um, but I just find like, I think that that premise of all of us finally having like, look, we have not had a unified telephone on, on earth, right? So let's think about earth over the past 50 years. We're not one country because we're all bombing each other 70 years ago. So that's, uh, we're not one, uh, we're one species. We're not one country. We don't have one language. We now do, which we emerge, the emerging default language for earth is English. Now that doesn't mean it's the most common spoken language. We would never measure the most, we would never measure the default by the most common thing because it's going to be an outlier. So China is obviously going to be the biggest one. So we don't measure what the common language for the planet is. We would measure what the common, the most popular second language is because that would mean any given person that you pluck out their highest population of people with second language abilities to, with the ability to speak a second language will be English. So the most common language understood by the most broadest reach of people would be the English language. So we've got an, we've got a unified language. We don't have a unif we've got a unified telephone now or information repository, which we call the internet. So think about that like a group database. We all chuck in, we all make web pages and shit. Um, but we never had a unified ledger. So we don't know what to record it on. Everyone's got their own ledgers on the internet. You know, what are your what's your database? What's my database? But the internet itself is the reservoir. English is the unified language. Bitcoin is finally a unified ledger. So now that we have a unified language, so we can talk to each other, we can communicate with whatever we're trying to communicate. We can put it in a unified place where we both know it will be the internet. Now we can store that that 
place that we put it, we can record that ledger entry on a thing that we can both see. Right now, Bitcoin is the most unified clock that we have online. Like, it, you know, if I tell you what's the time, that's different to, I say, hey, what's the current block height for you? And you're like, uh, 677801. I'm like, yeah, me too. We're in sync. Now, it's not to the second, but we don't care because everything only happens in confirmations and the blocks are 10 minutes. So if my world can't change in faster than 10 minutes, if my payments take 10 minutes, you know, because I've got to wait for my world to change is when I buy something or when I give something away or when I you know, transfer money. But because money is so influential, it changes us. So um, I just find that interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I just found that, find that stuff sort of interesting. Um, but I do think that we are, I think it's making everyone, okay, here's what it is. I think we're making, everyone is now understanding the value of work in general, the premise of it, like, proof of work if i if my incentive is not gatekeeped by a proof of work i know that this incentive will get exploited basically and so that work is that boundary and now because we're all understanding work i find i find bitcoin really interesting because it's like bitcoin is like we've invented a new color you know you think about what would a new letter sound like or look like and you can't really kind of grok it because you feel like it's already perfectly all taken up Bitcoin's kind of like that. It doesn't change. It's like red or blue. You say, oh, red shit, ban, ban red, cancel it, tax it. It's like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, you can't, it's a stupid thing to even say that out loud. It sounds like you're not in tune with what we're actually doing here on Earth, you know? And so Bitcoin is a new constant like that because we can't take it down. It's pegged into the threads of the universe now, at least from us locally. Um, so it's like the color blue, the number eight, whatever it is usage and dis distribution should be far and wide, just like colors and numbers. And Bitcoin will be the same thing. But what it's teaching us is that Bitcoin's discipline of not changing is, folk is helping us all see something not change. Because we live in a world where the only thing that happens is shit changes. We complain, something changes. We don't complain, nothing changes. Like we, we are very reactive like that. And so when we get to Bitcoin, everyone pays their their, let's call them their intellectual tuition. Um, myself included, everyone. No one's been free. Elon Musk even. Oh, Bitcoin would be good, but... And then they start sprinkling their turds on top of it. And what we all realise is that we all have that moment where we think, oh, no, it's good. And oh, trust me, I know, I know computer stuff. Like, I'm smart. It's good, I agree, but it'd be way better if... And they're missing the whole point of it. And what I've realised after you know, spending so much time looking at Bitcoin... It's changed me. I'm like, look at this, look at this dude. He's so stubborn. He doesn't change for anyone. Even Elon Musk. Either I like the cut of this guy's jib, and that's what I think. And when I think about Bitcoin, I'm like, man, I wish I was more like that. <laughs> you know, what a strong-willed dude. Anyway, so I found like that. People have looked at it like that, and I think the penny is dropping for a lot of people. Where look, proof of work is so elegant and simple in 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 the universe. Like, let's take looking, let's say uh, I want to get skinnier and I don't, I can do two things. I can go to the gym every day for a year or I can get liposuction. Liposuction costs money. Going for a run doesn't. Liposuction is like proof of stake, which is like, oh, cool. You look great. Oh, that everything looks in order. Oh my God, that's bad. Which is sort of like, let's think of a proof of stake network where people stake their capital and they get a promising return of security, whatever it is. So I give money to the doctor, I look good. But if I give time and effort to myself, I look good as well, but it takes longer. But I'm in a world of dopamine, adrenaline, stimulants, and you know everyone wants everything now. Because when I can pull up my phone and get everything instantly, like, a, dude, a candle can show up, new shoes can show up, all in, a, all in a touch of a button. When something doesn't come in a touch of a button, I immediately think, oh, this is so shit. And it's like, no, what it's trying to tell you is that all the stuff that comes in a touch of a button, you actually don't need it. You're just conditioned. You think you need it. But what I'm trying to tell you, and this is Bitcoin speaking, it's like, dude, heaps of it is junk. Find yourself. Like, that's what I feel like it's saying to me almost. Um, but anyway, it's given me a newfound appreciation for just, just work in general, just you got to put in something to get out something meaningful. Um, and that delayed gratification the reason why Bitcoin gets really unpopular is because all of us, whether you're the smartest person on earth, your dopamine is cooked. Our dopamine centers, which regulate the you know mood and happiness and you know feeling good and pleasure and stuff, um, 
people's dopamine centers are fried. And that means when they're fried, it means that you want short-term gratification. So things like scrolling on TikTok, scrolling on you know, YouTube shorts, Twitter, all this stuff, masturbation, drugs, food, all these things are our, our body is waiting for them because our society has been stimulation, stimulating us for so long. And so now we get to Bitcoin and it doesn't have any of that. It's like, nah, dude, like just do you focus on you, be disciplined and just one foot in front of the other. Bitcoin's not the fastest. It's not the cheapest. It's not the entity. But what it is, is really perfect for its audience, which is the most reliable. If I don't ever have to think about what the inflation policy is going to be of my money, I don't have to worry about how much more money I need to make because I can predict my income indefinitely. If there are no changes to the money supply and only changes to the distribution, then theoretically, I never, ever, ever have to think about money. Now, if you think if we have 86, if we have 86,400 seconds in a day, times that by four, so 86, 170, 340, so let's call it 355, that 345,000 thoughts, five seconds or four, thought, four thoughts for every second, right? A quarter of a second per thought. So we have 345,000 thoughts a day. Every single one of those is hamstrung by money. Hey man, do you want to come for lunch? I've got to, in the hierarchy of things, time, everything, I have to check the money box off. Do I have enough money? Yes or no. So I've had to think about it. It has been a filter on every thought, just like Instagram is a, you know, photos can get filtered now to make the photo look better or worse. Money, when I see the price tag or the money obligation of something, it's like a filter. It makes it better or worse to me. And so I find that quite interesting now. Like if you don't have to think about money every day, like, oh my God, my money, what am I, how am I going to make money today? How am I going to make money next year? How am I going to make, it's like the best example I can give is, let me just get this. Okay. It is, this is a highlighter. You know, highlighters, you buy yeah. them. Imagine you work every year, you work every day and you buy a highlighter at the end of the year. And that's what you do with your wages. You get paid once a year and you bought a highlighter. You earn a hundred grand, you paid hundred grand. Now Christmas time comes around next year. I bought my money. I, I mean, I bought my highlighter and I'm like, oh my God, I want to use this to write down a bunch of cool stuff. And I open it and 25% of it's gone. I'd be like, what the fuck? I haven't even used this yet. And it's like, what are you going to force me to use it instantly? And so now that's like, I've taken my time and bought with a time, with the money I made, I took my time and I got money in return. I took my money and I bought this highlighter. Now with money, the real money, like, I mean, with Bitcoin, this doesn't happen because the, the, it's not going like, it might go down in dollar value, but your supply, you own the same amount of supply. So all that stuff is just cosmetics. There are no mechanics of change. So with Bitcoin, it's like buying this highlighter and then the next year, because it's a deflationary currency, it's like this highlighter having overflowing with ink in it. Cash, when I have cash, when I earn $100,000 from the government or from, you know, from my job, if I bought this highlighter, well, basically I spend all my, my time over the year and that gives me a wage. If I take my wage and put it in my bank, it's like buying this highlighter and it losing value. Like it's melting in my bank, just like this, like fruit. If I buy a bunch of bananas, they're going to be rotten in seven days or whatever. It's like my money goes rotten. And it's like fruit had a really good answer to this where fruit is like, oh, okay, nature, like God, the architect or whoever built us, I don't know. Some, whoever built us is really good at building, by the way, we have a hundred percent uptime in our universe. We've never seen that on earth. 100% uptime. If it failed, we'd know about it. Right. So we've had a hundred percent uptime. That's pretty good. But like, uh, fruit, fruit solved this problem of going rotten by giving you seeds. It's like, Oh dude, I know it's going to fuck out in like seven days. Don't worry, dude. I got you, man. It's like, Oh really? It goes, yeah, dude, there's heaps of fruit in it. It's like, no, there isn't. There's this seeds. It goes, yeah, dude, the fruit grows. In, seed goes into a fruit. What? Oh, now it's a time preference thing. So it, fruit gives you more fruit and stuff like that. If you're willing to wait, just like if I buy Bitcoin, if I'm willing to wait, it will go up in value. Just like my fruit. If I'm willing to buy my fruit, yes, it might go rotten in seven days. But to avoid that, you've got free fruit forever because it comes with seeds so you can go plant more of it. And if you wait six months, you're good. Or one year or whatever it is for the fruit to grow. Just like nature, we wait for the fruit to grow. We can get it, but we have to wait. We've got to be patient. Money is the same thing. Money should function much like that, where it is, you don't earn money every year. What on 
earth is that system? That's a hamster wheel. That doesn't make sense. You should, money should be a problem that you solve and then it's solved. It's like you buy, you can't run because you don't have a pair of running shoes. You buy a pair of running shoes. Like that's the problem solved. You don't have to think every time you go for a run, fuck, how am I going to go for a run? I've got to buy a new pair of shoes. But every day when we wake up, we have to think, how am I going to preserve my money? And now that causes just the worst case scenario, which is all these retail people that aren't, let's call them, then there's all these rules and regulations to protect them, which is they don't know financial literacy or whatever. So they've got to be protected. Bro, they are dead. Because if you're inflating a currency at 15%, call it, be generous and say 10%. I know it's not 10% because I read price tags, not what they're telling me. And the price tags, nothing has gone up by just 10%. No way. So now let's imagine that. So I am retail dude. I don't know anything about money, but everyone's protecting me from Bitcoin because it's bad and we don't know about it and it's going to lose you money. I've got to become a hedge fund trader. Like I'm a retail person trying to make money, but my money's going down by 20% a year. So you want me to turn into a hedge fund manager where now I've got to try and figure out how to beat the market by like 23% every year. Dude, I mean, look, I like to think of myself as pretty good at a couple of things, but that ain't one of them. I ain't doing that. And that's not something that anyone should subscribe to, but that is the ask that is being made of everybody. And so if I had to take that trade, I'd say, well, there's a lot to learn in understanding the markets, or there's one thing to understand, which is Bitcoin. And I really think the choices that people are making now, they're, they're choosing to simplify their life. That life is complex. Push notifications blowing up every two seconds. And life is full of so much noise. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, oh, this is, someone's opened an envelope. Someone like this, someone did that. So it's like, I'm sure someone's doing everything all the time, but Bitcoin helps us slow down and be like, oh, 10 minutes isn't fast enough. What's the rush, dude? And you're like, oh, because, uh, uh, yeah, actually, what is the rush? What the fuck was I rushing this whole time for? And you start realizing it's not about, like, we still work 40 hours a week, but the optimizations to do our job has incre increased arguably 400 million percent so now all we're doing is we're still doing the same jobs we're just they're just getting more out of you people are like oh yes chat gbt that's mad and i'm like yeah it's mad you think you're the first employee that's going to use it no dude everyone is going to use it and when everyone uses it that means your output is to expected you you've just changed the expectations on your output Oh, I didn't know you could write a three-page essay in 20 minutes. Cool. I need 100 of those by Friday. And now you're like, shit, I don't like that. Anyway, so I, I think you asked me one question about half an hour ago, and I've just been rambling the whole time, dude. No, it's been awesome. A lot to unpack there. And, you know, definitely I want to get into the past, present, and future. You know, you, you talked a lot of interesting things about respect and security, especially, uh, you know, in the cryptographic and cryptocurrency world and mm. <clears throat> learning and sort of being optimistic. And um, you said you moved to San Francisco, I think, 2013. So I immediately yeah. thought about, uh, you know, the dot com boom in 2000. I missed that. I, I lived in San Francisco in 2004, 2005. Yeah, uh, 2008, yeah. you have sort of, uh, you know, the social media boom and buzz. Yes. And you kind of missed and that now, too. Yeah, Bitcoin and all that stuff. Yeah. But 2013, was... maybe to 2019, 2020 was, was maybe not full on the city, but crypto was really it's, focused it's in it. San Francisco. Yeah, uh, maybe it, it was. It's it. It. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't the only sure. thing going on there, but it was a scene. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine the amount of euphoria and, and you were in that and you were kind of meeting yeah. with interesting people. And so I wonder how you kind of focused your way through that, remained optimistic, didn't get um, taken with all these people creating their own ledgers. Yes. Creating yeah, their yeah. own money. Yeah. Uh, you might yep. service them, you might help them, but, you know, maybe you didn't get... We serviced, uh, yeah, we serviced all of them, all of them. And it was so funny because, dude, the amount of work that went into trying to raise money was so challenging when you're in an environment where every person that's trying to raise money is saying we're doing a token in 18 months and you'll get 100x on your token and we're saying we don't want to do a token because we didn't like we always thought of a token model as a scapegoat it's the thing you do if you can't actually do your job like not in a rude way but most of them that's what they do they're like ah 
And it was always seen as a layup for fundraising. Like, oh, well, look, if everything shits the bed, no one's raising money, we can do a Togemon. And it's like, but in your head, you're like, no, fuck that. That's like, it feels like, um, like running, doing a marathon in rollerblades or something. It's like, you know, you can do it. Like you already know it's done. Like that's a, but you're kind of biting the poison apple. Um, I'd always known we were always agnostic as a company because we were like a developer focused tool. We didn't want to pick winners or losers. We did pick winners to a certain degree. Like we never listed all the old coins and stuff like that. And so we're very strict with that because we didn't really see any value in them. Like every time you list a new chain, like, you know, it's like Binance has listed shitcoin 101 or whatever. It's like, that's fine, but now you need an engineer to maintain that chain, that demon, that you know the the protocol daemon or whatever it is, all that kind of stuff. It's work, and so like when you get these fly by night things like Pepe and all this junk, it's like, oh, why don't you list Pepe? It's like, bro, because I don't want to build it build it out for you guys to be gone in two weeks because I know you guys better than you guys know you guys. I've seen it all. I've seen almost every single developer that is building something from 2013 to 2018. So whatever products exist that were built between 2013 and 2018, there's a good chance of like, we, or it was someone on our team has worked with them, talked to them, spoke to them or done something with them. Um, and so with that, you get, look, if you're a coach and you get a thousand people trying out for your football team, you're going to get a good compass on who's got what and what the general sentiment of the audience is. Who's like, are they a good audience or are they shit audience? If you're only talking to developers that are building these products, we get to see the success criteria and the fail criteria. Like what we'd find, we'd be able to see the common execution paths that people would take that would be successful or be failures. And uh, what I mean by that is basically, you know, when startups come to you, you can sort of see, oh, that's their plan. And we try and say, don't do this because you'll find here's what they did and they screwed up. And you want to like in this industry, we're all we're all poor. We're all trying to figure it out. Like as you know, everyone's starting out. So everyone's got no resource and just enthusiasm and hope. That's all everyone has. Right now, figure out the rest. And so you never want to kind of be the person to be like, well, that's not going to work because of X, Y and Z. Go fuck yourself. You want to be like, hey, guys. Totally get it. Just giving you some feedback that we've seen. It might help. We're all trying to help each other because I don't want a team to waste time for 12 months and then be like, oh shit, we could have missed this with one conversation because there is these things in FinTech, especially there's so much red tape and nuance that it can just be the difference between having a one hour conversation or half an hour conversation. And they go, oh, I know why you want to do it that way because of this, this, and this. And as the entrepreneur, they're like, yeah. And he's like, ah, but you didn't think of this, which comes after that. And then they're like, oh, and there's these times where you're about to drive your company off a cliff almost because you had, you missed something. But the feedback loop and being willing to be coachable is I'd say the most important attribute or skill that you can have to get ahead. Because if you're not coachable, you can't grow fast. If I've got a coach, they will help me grow fast. If I trust them and if they're good at what they do. But if I never trust the coach, then my growth is inhibited by whatever the pipe, however that pipe of trust is, however big or small that is. That's how much information I'm going to be taking in. And so just learning about that and then getting the chance to mentor kids that are you know younger, earlier in their journey. You know, some of them, it's not so much an age thing. It's more like the company age. They might be one or two years in and I've got a lot of experience being one or two years in so I can help them with that. Um, and basically I just send them the laundry list of fuck ups, which is a mile long, by the way. I'm lucky. I'm actually quite lucky. Here's the thing. I feel like I got super lucky. So at school, like most people are talented at shit. I'm retarded at pretty much everything I try, like bowling, everything. Like I'm just not, I'm not naturally good at shit. Like, but the things I like, I'll play a thousand times until I do get okay at it. Uh, but I'm more of a repetition person, not like a natural talent person, but that's good because if you get used to sucking at things, like, dude, I've got an F my whole life. I forgot what L I only know L's and F's like W's I'm not familiar with. So for me, I'm you failing and sucking at stuff is the norm. And I don't know why people don't want to stomach this. Like nobody, you couldn't speak English the first time you tried. You couldn't read a clock the first time you tried. You couldn't ride a bicycle the first time. Hell, you couldn't even walk the first time you tried. You couldn't even eat the first time you tried. 
why, you know, why wouldn't we look at that as a mechanism to say, okay, maybe repetition is a thing, guys. Like we need to actually, people aren't going to get it the first time. I mean, me, perfect example, Bitcoin. I remember reading the white, actually, I don't know if I read the white paper, but I'd heard about it 30 or 40 times before I finally go, okay, what is it? And we all do that. We're all guilty of that. But um, yeah, I just think, I think, uh, the, oh man, to, to, to say that this space has taught me a lot is the biggest understatement of the year. Like, I feel in debt. Like, I feel like every person that I talk to in this space, you just learn heaps of shit from. Or people are just really smart in it. I don't know, but some of these people that have been in the space forever that are very kind of like very in tune with like governments and currencies and stuff like that, I have no clue about that stuff. So I'm like, okay, this is cool. I don't know how those people live knowing what they know without Bitcoin. Like if Bitcoin was never a thing, and let's say, you know, that I think it's sort of like before Bitcoin, I think people were sort of like libertarian and gold bugs or whatever. And that was their kind of outlet. But I'm like, dude, I would have gone fucking crazy on this planet. If they're just printing money willy nilly and there's no solution or alternative, like you're just at the mercy of the master the whole time. So yeah, I've just found that quite interesting, but yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's good. It's been a it's been an amazing journey. I like, you know, I just can't believe how lucky I am or we all are, but well, I don't th- even think we know how lucky we are. If Bitcoin is gonna do what we think it is, and it is as big as we think it, infinity divided by 21 million and all that stuff, which I do believe, I really do, probably to a point of delusion. Like I literally have to check if I'm retarded because I'm like, I am too delusional on this because I feel like this is too good to be true. And my instincts when something feels too good to be true is I'm just scarred by the fiat world. It usually is. But in this industry, too good to be true can exist because it is all true because the only things that exist are built on work. And so it's kind of interesting when you're like, oh, Bitcoin's too good to be true, but it's like, well, it's the only thing that's true. Like everything else is like had someone's greasy hands on it or something. Anyway. This is such a philosophical rabbit hole with this stuff. I'm sorry. I want to go I further like down. So uh, I'm going to jump through your past. I mean, there's a million questions I have about your past, but we're going to jump into the present. And I like how you think about Bitcoin as a constant. I think about Bitcoin a lot as a constant, almost like 21 million is a mathematical concept. It's a fixed yes. point in the universe. I know 21 fixed million doesn't ever actually exist in the sense that some people can't access, use, or move certain Bitcoins or quote unquote lost them or they're destroyed. Uh, but it's always 21 minus N in that r- regard. Yes. And, and it's fixed and we can't produce more unless we all agreed to. And I don't, I don't see that happening. So uh, what I like then, we kind of take Bitcoin almost out of it. And we're kind of looking more at mathematics, cryptography, thermodynamics or energy. Mm. And so I kind of want to get into mathematics and and, and numbers. So how, how or why are we going to treat numbers like a species in the future? Really good question. Um we treat things like a species or dignify them, let's say, um, if they sort of all have a, uh, similar attributes, like like that's how we cohort things by their identities, right? Like whether they are cold blooded, hot blooded, whatever it is, they fly, they don't fly. They're plants, they're not plants, they're fungi, they're not fungi. I think numbers are going to be like the common thing that all of those things have uh, in common is that they all affect gravity basically and we all affect gravity um but we're perceiving them more like units of energy and so the reason why is that we we like these species affect our environment now we don't think that numbers affect our environment but if you look we don't treat numbers as real as they are like because we just attack we don't attach we think numbers are just sort of arbitrary like they just pop up everywhere and i'm saying more like you know, frangipanis or roses, they don't pop up everywhere. Like I can't find roses in Arizona in the middle next to a cactus. They're not going to be sitting there. Roses show up in certain areas, just like I believe numbers show up in certain environments. So, you know, the number 21 million will show up a lot around Bitcoin environment because it's related to Bitcoin very heavily. Um, And I think that numbers behavior is actually predictable. The the behavior of numbers is very predictable. Um, And the structure of prime numbers feels like, so prime numbers are the big, big ingredient. They're almost like nature's proof of work. So let's think about uh, a proof of work. It's where I check something and I say, yep, that looks good. It's ticked all the boxes, done. Onward we go. And that's a block. And then we move forward to the next block. Nature and numbers 
prime numbers specifically, what we're doing when we get a prime number, I hand it to you. And let's say you're the Bitcoin miner. I hand you a block proposal and you go, mm, yep, header, yep. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I, that's a valid block. Thank you. Now with numbers, it's the same thing. It's like I hand you a number and I say, this number is prime. And you go, number seven, you go, okay, well, number six, that's not a divisor. Number five is not a divisor. Number four, number three, number two, and number one is we have a prime number. And you go, thanks very much, Mike. Come back to me when you got the next prime number. And so I come back to you and I sort of assemble these prime numbers with you and you check. And that's basically... Each prime number is like a block on the blockchain where we have to do work to prove that a number is prime. When there's no nothing other than the observer makes something prime. Like we've got rules that we classify something as prime number. Um, and so back to if if number if prime numbers are these collisions that connect to our cryptographic keys, right? So there's two, we we get a cryptographic key by smashing two big prime numbers together. And if, if I move anything on those keys, like let's say Satoshi's coins moved, right? Satoshi's coins moved. Everyone would write an article that Satoshi's coins moved. And, you know, I don't have to predict the future to know that. I know that there'll be an article on the block. There'll be an article on Coindesk. There'll be trout on a Twitter and it'll be all trending. Now, does that make me have a time machine and predict the future? No, it doesn't. But it does help me understand my environment and the levers that can be pulled to change the energy around it. So how do numbers, why would numbers be more like a species? Because a species, like if a, if a lion walks down the street or in the middle of you know New York, it's going to part. People are going to be like the reaction. People are going to have a reaction. So it has infected that environment. It's got gravity. Um, just like numbers. If we move that number that links Satoshi's keys and coins, if we have that number, that number's got a huge amount of gravity to it, like a huge amount of weight. Now, just looking at it, you might not know, but when you do understand it, you'd see how much weight it has. Now, a, a different example would be the coins that I locked into the future. This key is a number. Now, that number's existence being known by everyone carries a tremendous amount of energy displacement on the surface area, the human meat sack area. Now, it's just a number on the number line in a cryptographic universe. Um, but in the meat space universe, when that number does anything, huge amounts of stuff happen on the surface area. So just like when Satoshi's key does something, it was just opens a transaction, sends one Satoshi somewhere. Just had done, that number has just like demanded a huge amount of gravity. It said, who the fuck, like who can't see me basically, you know, like, and that's so when I think about numbers being a species, I think about, and I'm still trying to grok this thought properly. I can't explain it as well as I'd like to, but basically they only ever show up under certain conditions only. And that's like, you know, and that's sort of um, trying to say that numbers live in environments, just like animals live in environments or flowers flourish in certain environments. Prime numbers would flourish really be really well in uh, cryptography because they're used so commonly. Um, and yeah, so how do they carry gravity? I think what I'm saying is that a cryptographic key is only two numbers smashed together and an electrical current on the computer, on the machine that process that thing where you say, make me a new key. The electrical current runs through the circuit board and it shows up, you've got a new key on your screen. But in your, there was an electrical current in that computer. So what we know is that if I had, if I zoom, if I had this computer and I could see the electrical current running through the machine and I'd see the, the cryptographic key on my computer screen, I'd know that these two are entangled. Now that electrical current matches this because this, that electrical current produced what I'm seeing. So somewhere in that electrical current, it's like, imagine it's a really thin pipe with information somewhere in that electrical current encoded was this address. And so when I think about us, we're just electrical current. Like I'm just tick tock, tick tock from head to heart, head to heart, head to heart, head to heart, just like a computer, the circuit board, it's running along the circuit board. So those numbers to me, here's a better question. If I, if your numbers went down, you open your Bitcoin stack and their numbers were different, your day would be very different. Now, you don't know the connection to them and we hand wave it off to an emotional attachment because of the wealth and things like that or whatever it is, the problems that it solves for your future, that if that's gone, it's now reintroduced all those problems. 
that's the gravity. Like, does that make sense? Where it's like, we don't know how much things can change. A perfect example. What would your day look like if you woke up in Coin Gecko? The number didn't say 27498. It said 555555. So Bitcoin's gone to half a million dollars overnight. Everyone, I can guarantee you the composition and energy composition of every household that holds Bitcoin has changed. Um, and that's what I mean when numbers carry gravity. It's they're so highly influential. We don't really know just how influential they are yet. Um, but here's the fun part about this. You know, we all talk about, or I talk about this a lot. I think about it a lot, which is I felt really bummed that we were too young to be going to the stars and too old to find any new stuff on earth. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, oh, well, everyone's done anything on earth and well, I'm too young because we don't have fast and light travel. So we're not going to another galaxy. So oh, I'm stuck here. Well, there's a couple of things we've got, which are the new space frontiers and stuff. And I think, I think energy and time is one of those new frontiers where Bitcoin is going to introduce the power of energy efficiency because we've never needed energy efficiency. We've, ne we've had an abundance of energy on the planet that's been sort of filtered and deployed by one party or, you know, five parties, these big energy companies. But now it's every man for themselves innovate you get rewarded for innovating on energy efficiency and it's not i'm not asking for a subsidy i'm not asking for anything i'm just saying this network will reward me that is absolute certainty um yeah anyway so it's a bit it's kind of interesting but i think that accelerates the energy conversation that's where i think all this goes i think what happens is we're all starting after you've been in this space where you've thought about it for you know you've been it for a year two years five days everyone's different but it took me like 10 or 11 years to realize, oh, this isn't money is not the thing. It's energy because that's all we are. We, money is this kind of cock blocker that we put in the way of everything. But energy is part of the universe. Money is not. And so now we're kind of realizing that where we're like, oh, money is quite defunct and debunked. If there's no energy involved in the money production process, then the money doesn't the money is terminally ill before it starts, you know? And that's why this might, I feel like fiat money is quite, quite literally terminally ill. Uh, it's like a sick patient. You can see there's no hope for them there. It's just say your goodbyes. Um, because everyone is learning that nothing good comes without work. Uh, and I think the people that are learning this got to learn this. I think the harder, harder way is, you know, Ethereum's just switched to proof of stake and, you know, from the technical merit and stuff like that, uh, awesome to be trying new things but you know if i built a financial product the only thing that matters is security so i would never ever ever be willing to accept a known secondary security policy like why would i take the second best one if there's a best one and you think about it and then you kind of get onto it and you're like oh well what conditions would i take the second best one i'll tell you what conditions i'd take the second best one when i'm pretty sorted if i'm okay then I'm pretty comfortable with the secondary security policy. Like I've made my money. I'm, this isn't my dream anymore. You know, like if I'm staking on Ethereum, it's like you need 32 ETH to stake. Not everyone has 32,000 US dollars. What the fuck is that? That's ridiculous. And so you have the rich get richer, but it's funny because all the people in Ethereum, I don't know how I got here, but just thinking about proof of stake versus proof of work. If you look back at, you know, you, see, you hear these stories like, oh, the Rothschild family or whatever, right? And they're, oh, they own the world. Dude, if we have 30, million, 30 billion devices online, let's say phones, cars, everything, 30 billion, and let's treat the internet's population like it's 30 billion, uh, and that includes devices, AGIs, artificial and everything. The people that got into the pre-sale for Ethereum or are staking and making money on the Ethereum staking and stuff like that, they look like the Rothschilds. If you've got a population of 30 billion people in 40 years or 50 years' time... And they look back and they go, how big was the population? And I was like, oh, it's 6 billion, 7 billion people. And they go, what? And these 100,000 people thought it would be a good idea for the rest of time to have 32 ETH when it's meant to be an appreciating asset. How did they think we were ever going to participate in that? And that's what's so retarded. And so people don't realize that. The population is growing too, dude. They're all going to look like the Rothschilds because the Rothschilds, everyone who got a special treatment or a layup 50 or 60 years ago is looked at like a fucking nemesis now. People hate them. And look, the Rothschild might be nice people and they were just smarter than everyone at the time, which is probably the case. But history doesn't look back on that nicely in a way. Um, 
But anyway, I just think proof of work is, oh man, it's taught me so much. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's just taught me a lot. I can't even remember where we were going, but I'm just sort of rambling. Thanks well, for talking about proof of work. No, no yeah. worries. That was awesome. Talking about proof of work though. Mm. I want to get into your time traveling Bitcoin piece and, and your experiment here. <clears throat> you touched yeah. on it a little bit before, but let's kind of break it out some more. So, mm. I mean, you took an enormous amount of work. Yeah. Um, and let's we can outline what you sent into the future, and you sent it very far into the future. So, how is this a wormhole? And and what are you trying to do here? And maybe outline what you did send and when it's going to be released. Yeah. So basically, what I did, I was like, the whole premise was Bitcoin is going to break when there's no more Bitcoins to be mined. That was one of the FUD fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's so not quite... your premise. That's a premise you're saying. That's our premise. Yeah. Okay. The premise was that this thing, this is a problem, and everyone likes to complain about it. I was like, well, how can we solve it? Oh, we well, can you make more coins. No one wants to do that. Well, we all control our own coins. So theoretically, someone can put the rewards there. If they were willing to do that, they can donate them, right? Um, and so that was the premise was like, well, we can solve it ourselves by putting the coins there. The longer we wait to put the coins there, the more expensive it gets. Because if Bitcoin's doubling every four years, it's only going to get more expensive to do it. So I was like, all right, let's lock some coins there so that if nothing else, we'll lock coins into the future just like the reward cycles every 10 minutes or, you know, every 210,000 blocks is a new halving. Let's lock lots of coins into the future. And now people in the not so distant future have a rebuttal to people that say, hey, this is, this is bullshit. Bitcoin's going to run out of coins, transaction fees. Well, they can say, well, yeah, that's true. But until this point, now someone has made a block reward schedule out of their own coins because they can. And so now it's up to miners. Basically what I've done, because we can't introduce new coins, there's a thing called time locks on Bitcoin. And that's where you basically lock money until a certain block height. And so what I was like was, okay, the last block height is block 7,139,999. And that's the zero Satoshi era when there's one Satoshi and it goes down to zero. So the block rewards 50 million you know, 50 Bitcoins halves to 25 all the way down to zero. And then after that, there's half a Bitcoin, quarter of a Bitcoin, it's sort of one one hundredth reward, but in the same structure. And so that basically allows people in the future to always have something to mine. And so if you think about this like a physical system, miners are like Columbus traveling across the ocean. In, in Later in the Bitcoin's chain, when there's no reward and stuff, these miners are sort of venturing on a journey of good faith. If you don't know what your reward is, you're basically going on a whim of hoping transaction fees are high or something like that. Now, what we're doing by locking coins into the future, we're giving certainty to Bitcoin miners, which provides certainty in the reward or deterministic reward schedule because Bitcoin miners participate in Bitcoin because the reward is deterministic. They know exactly how much they will get if they win a block next year, four years away, which means I need to know those variables if I'm going to take out a lease on a factory, rent equipment, build mining rigs, get hydroelectric station relationship, I need those level of predictability because you can't have too many variables. Now, if you change the supply all the time, so Ethereum likes to talk about how they've changed the supply and how it's ultrasound money and stuff. People don't get it. This The, the answer is not a higher supply or a low supply or, you know, of inflation rate. It's a constant predictable one because if you have predictability, you reduce risk. My risk goes up when my predictability goes down. My risk goes down when my predictability goes up. So like we were saying, you know, you can take this kind of, you don't have to think about it once you've gotten, once you grok Bitcoin and you understand it and you're starting to stack and, you know, preserve your wealth correctly, you start realizing, oh my God, I'm an idiot. Like everything else is melting, but this. And so you start building confidence in your decision and conviction. Um, but I do think it's the deterministic nature that makes it successful, not whether it's a 1% inflation rate or a 30% inflation rate. That's not the metric or the marker. That's a bonus point. The predictable, mar the marker that people, only people pile on and build shit on is if something's predictable. I'm not going to go and build my four-story home 
if I haven't had the geologist or the site builder, the site visitor come in and say, yeah, this is bedrock we're building. Like there's no way I'm going to start building the home and only to find out we built it on clay, not the bedrock. And now it's all toast. People would never build the home. And t- imagine you're a ge- you imagine you're building a building in Japan and you can't speak to a geologist. It's an earthquake city. Like you can't build whatever you're trying to build unless you know for certainty the ground you're standing on. And that's what Bitcoin does with wealth. People know for certainty the financial grounds that they're standing on, not Oh, did someone mint some coins last night behind under the table? Oh, what happened to those other coins that got me? Well, how many are lost? Are no, I know every single thing and I can sleep like a baby because I know that no one can get their mitts on it or make special, you know, amendments on the side. And I think that is what everyone hasn't realized yet, but it's bottled it up and it's basically said, dude, you know, you used to think about money every single day of your life. Yeah, dude, don't worry. Think about other cool shit. Surfing. Do you like surfing? Do you like table tennis? What do you like? Life is about to start now because you're not on the hamster wheel because if my money's melting, I have to be on the hamster wheel by definition, because I need to keep replenishing my melting blocks of ice. But if my blocks of ice, like, and there's chemistry reactions with like coal ovens where they spray chemicals on the lumps of coal that makes it that big. Like the lump of coal goes from that big to that big. And now, you know, steel manufacturing and shit can do stuff. That's what Bitcoin is. You buy this much, it's, you can spend that much in 10 years. It'll grow. It's like a plant. It will grow. Like if your plant grows in your house, your Bitcoins are going to grow in your pocket. They're not going to grow in an exchange, just like you're not going to put your plant in someone else's home and hope that they water it. You can't count on them to water it or to love it as much as you. Your Bitcoins, if you treat them like plants where they're in your control, they're in your love and care and you treat them with respect and whatever, um, you raise them and they flourish. All you've got to do is just not lose them. I've lost heaps of coins before. It's the worst, but it happens. And you've got to, you just mental model has to be ready to lose things, to gain things, but just to be appreciative when you do have a stack or any kind of stack, you're light years ahead. Oh, like put it this way. I'm not a, I'm not a smart person, but I'm not an idiot either. If any person was coming to me for, they wanted to know how to get ahead in life and they're 10 years old, I would say work every day and just start buying Bitcoin. And everyone can say what they want about, oh, it's too volatile, whatever. I would recommend, I'm not recommending people to buy Bitcoin. I'm recommending them to buy a predictable supply schedule. That's all. Now show me anything that's got it. That's what you should be buying. Okay. There's only one thing on earth that has it and that's Bitcoin. Okay. And that's where we're starting. That's the only asset. You need diversification. So if you think about your portfolio, people split it to property and bonds and stuff. No, split it to deterministic and indeterministic. You know, and you, that those two buckets, you can have deterministic wealth preservation and indeterministic wealth preservation. The indeterministic bucket is going to be not sleepless nights, confusion, paperwork, red tape, landlord bills, auction bill, everything bills, construction, maintenance, everything. Or there's Bitcoin, which is buy it, hold it, don't lose it, and get learning. One is way easier than the other. And now Let's build the case for the Bitcoin case. Who is going to do that? The lazy person is going to do that. Who's getting lazy? Everyone's getting lazy. Why are we getting lazy? Because our dopamine is so fried. Our dopamine is so fried because we're on devices the whole time. So if we're on devices the whole time and our dopamine's fried, we're all going to be lazy, which means people are going to want less returns with more certainty than more returns with less certainty. So that's what Bitcoin does. Bitcoin gives less returns, but more certainty. But the returns, less. It's like 200% every three years. What did you want? 300%? Like, do you know what I mean? We start feeling like, you know, like, I'm pretty sure like half of these people are like, oh, Bitcoin, do something. It's like, mate, I saw your bank account a year ago. You were in an 0.05% term deposit. You sit down, young lady, and stop complaining. Do you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) that's kind of what you think. Um, yeah, I, I, I get it all. Like I get the desire to, you know, want bigger return. It's a natural thing, but it's funny. We have to sort of circuit break ourselves and be like, hold on. I'm complaining that this isn't doing enough. Jeez. I would never go back to the old way. Sorry for complaining. You know, you have a moment of gratitude for a second there. Um, yeah, but man, I just feel so privileged. Like what an exciting time. We're all still trying to figure it out. We don't even know if it's going to work. We don't even know if it's not going to work. But man, it's just, it, it's cool. And I hope the people in the future are looking back on us today being like, guys, thanks for giving, thanks for giving it a crack. Muchos gracias. Yeah.
<laughs> yeah, so I want to I want to crack into this. So a lot of things came to mind here. Um, I, I love that you know this is like a wormhole into the future, and we can push forward sats, and there's zero entropy. Mm -hmm. uh, I find this experiment to be incredibly perplexing and a paradox, though, and I I, I want I have so many up and down thoughts about it. Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, and it also brought up a few anecdotes for me. One, um. You know, when people talk about like wealth, like rich versus wealth, and it makes me think of an old Chris Rock joke. And he says, you know, like Shaq is rich, Oprah is wealthy. And if Oprah woke up with Shaq's money, she would jump out of the Sears Tower and slit her neck on the ah, way down. Slit her throat on the way down. It's the and, best. And, and that's where, you know, you kind of get this uh, relationship between humans and numbers and worth and value and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we also were thinking about... Um, you know, when we think about freedom and and the power of Bitcoin and Satoshi's and the value of a sad, I really think about you know the movie Shawshank Redemption and Red and and Brooks. So you know, Red goes into prison or Brooks goes into prison. He spends his whole life in prison and he gets out and he's still in prison. Mentally, he's never left. He's institutionalized. He's not a free man inside or out. Uh, Red goes into prison and he finds a way to find you know freedom within the prison. You know, he develops a hobby collecting rocks and polishing yeah. them and whatever and way to spend his time. And be free in his mind. And so I think about, you know, when someone buys their first sats, and it, I don't care if they buy them on Cash App or they they yeah. self-custody, but when you, you buy $10 or $100 in sats and you think about, I don't care if you move them through a third-party app, but you think about how these are yours and no one can get between you and how many, uh, your portion of the network. It's a very powerful yeah. thing when you think about inflation. Your slice it, of a, the pie is not changing. Yes. Go to sleep and, comfortably knowing that. Yes. And as a family man with an economics degree and an accounting degree and a finance degree and just trying to solve life's little money problems, yeah. having something that doesn't melt is is is, is a renaissance. Is, but how does that change your peace of mind personally? Like, uh, you know, a million crazy. percent. That's million what I mean. You don't, even have to, you don't even have to experience the increase in purchasing power of the, the Bitcoin. You don't even have to get a Nothing. lot of Bitcoin. You can yeah. realize you have a tool there that can work to solve this particular problem and how much you yeah. want to you know, get of that tools up to you and how much you need of it to get the piece you need. But what I find really perplexing about this is how bearish it seems to me, but not just how bearish it seems to me sending these sats into the future as if the, the transaction fees won't be enough. And as if, you know, whatever that w wouldn't yeah. be enough to keep miners, um, you know, incentivized. But yeah. it also makes me think of the movie Back to the Future and what what could this could be an amazing or an awful experiment for humanity? Um, yeah. I, I don't know. And I don't know yeah. uh, what what it's going to look like for you in the future. Your legacy, meaning is this going to be mm -hmm. referred to as, you know, Dunworth's gift to humanity or mm -hmm. Dunworth's. Or is this the know, poison pill that ruined everyone's day or yeah. ruined his own legacy or Dunworth's yeah. remorse? You, you know, I mean, he's just having a lot of sats. That will accrue a lot of purchasing value into the future yeah. and then will affect possibly. And I, that's what's interesting, uh, how this gets disseminated in the future. Uh, does so all of humanity he, pull together and partake? Does yeah. the biggest government win this thing? Uh, does a, this is the thing. Yeah. I'll give is you this going to a David thing. and Goliath battle? Everyone's hoping David gets the sats and can buy yep. guns to fight Goliath. I mean. Yep. So. Here's what I think happens, right, is what well, here's what I really hope happens. The ideal scenario is be that everyone sees this iceberg coming from a really far, far away. Like we're 120 years away and we can see it coming, right? We have the chain that shows us it's there. We can prove everything. But not a lot of people would be paying attention right now. No, like, no, 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 no one's, no one's paying attention. See, even people Only who mind, people are probably that have not heard paying about attention it. to it. Yeah, and heard about it and the novelty value, like, oh, cool, oh, yeah, right. I see it. But it's not like it's changing anyone's life. People aren't like, oh, I'm getting ready. It's like only 120 years away. That's not happening. But what will happen over time is as people, I think there's going to be lots of these keys where people sort of say thank you to the network for the beautiful gift of life. You think people are going to follow it. in your footsteps? I think, I think if I can do it and I'm one person, I think that almost sets a certainty that other people will do that to some degree. But um I do think, okay, so is and, it bearish? Yes or no? It's bearish in, it's not bearish. It's more to just remove the, even entertaining that point of FUD. Oh, well, what if transaction fees are high? Don't know, don't care. What if There's no one follows suit? Yeah. 
No one follows suit. And you're, yeah, and, and it's like, but we need, the, uh, and somehow uh, the bearish uh, premise pans out and yep. miners are like, we need these uh, Dunworth sats that are coming. Yeah. And, and then and, they've already, and, I put them, there's already a hundred. Because at this point, there's not going to be a lot of um, maybe appetite for humanity to send more sats forward. Yeah, maybe well that because now it's gotten more, it, it's a choke point where it gets heavier and heavier. So I did it like two years ago now. So anyone that does it today, they've got two years of the network's wait. Like I, if you started uh, earlier than someone, it's like it's like sed uh, sediment on the rocks, like the layers of rock, right? When you dig into the earth, you see like the age of the earth by the rock contouring and stuff like that. You know, this is two years earlier, so it's a layer two years below whatever layers are coming up uh, now. So, look, I think, is it bearish? I think it's actually more of a case of even if it is, even if transaction fees are bearish, they're not anymore. Even if there was zero transaction fees, this still makes it the most value-driven play for a miner anyway. So, basically, it's got enough incentive for the miners to actually give a shit about it and not be like oh cool it's like a no no no, stop everything we need to attend to this kind of thing so that gets the attention of the miners and now you have well what happens to all the people that aren't miners or what happens if one miner wins it relative to the network rewards they've won i think it's like the past it's like the past uh 10 the last 10 halving cycles paid for so it's like the amount I've locked is like the equivalent with the last 10 halving cycles or something like that, maybe more. Um, but the idea is that it pays for all the future halving cycles. So transactions, someone here, no one here, it doesn't matter. Even if there is no one using the network, someone will still be mining on the network because there's a massive carrot worth pursuing that is 50 million times everything. So even if it, it, it basically it's so astronomically large so astronomically large it, it, literally it's like it, it is incomprehensible it's like someone today saying do you want a trillion dollars yes i would like a trillion dollars thank you well you got to drive into the middle of australia that's fine i'm renting a car right now i'll see you there in an hour like do you know what i mean it's that much of a forcing function so that's one to get the awareness of the miners um and i think miners are going to have lots of these blocks where there's lots of these lucky dip kind of reward blocks, let's say, these are bonus blocks. I think there's going to be lots of them in the future and miners are going to need, they're going to be part of their mining strategy. Um, now, what happens when this block's coming up, right? It's about to be mined, the next block, everyone's got the private key. Who's going to win this block in the future, right? We've locked it all there. I think because it's going to be so drastic, it will, and this is one of the deliberate reasons, was make it a really exaggerated reward, really exaggerated, so that it is so good that it makes people not want to compete with each other and forces people to hedge, which means if I'm Iris Energy and you're Riot, but we're both seeing something that could pay our bills for 25 years in front of us, we're going to figure out a way to shake hands and do a pooling operation where whatever, if you win, I'm getting a cut. If you win, I'm getting a cut. But the reward is so big, it's too big. I, I almost, I mean, my my optimistic vision, well, my pessimistic vision is that your descendants are going to hate you. Oh, and God. <laughs> probably. That probably will anyway. I've done it. Well, I just mean at that moment. I mean, at that moment when they're like, Michael had a half of Bitcoin and he didn't save it for us? Uh um, <laughs> fuck him <laughs> the optimistic version and i don't know how this plays out but one scenario is that everyone's mining their toasters mining their exactly you know, their home heaters mining their uh pool heaters mining their yep. electric hybrid cars anything mining whatever is it is plugged in anything's is plugged in that's one one way i see looking at the future and in that way uh most of these people would pool together and they would get sprinkled some Dunworth sats when, yeah. uh, you know, family has like seven sats for, you know, a generation and, and they might get two or three out of this thing. Yeah. And, and yeah. that would just be like, you know, Willy Wonka, the golden ticket kind of thing. It is. It's like a golden um, ticket or the everlasting gobstopper. You know, they, they you lick the everlasting gobstopper. It doesn't, it's not going anywhere. It's kind of like that where it's so large that it shouldn't be usable like by one entity and i think the premise of it was in the positive side was i hope that it was so big that it forced the world's biggest kind of multi-sig all at one moment which is basically and it might be 
you know, uh, 8 billion of 8 billion multi-sig, well, it wouldn't be that. It'd be, you know, clusters of multi-sigs where your local municipality is a multi-sig that is contributing to the Australian multi-sig. And it's almost like the whole world is connected, ready for this one moment, which is like a moment in time. It's the last moment. It is quite literally the first, the last block of the chain. So when Satoshi started it from the Genesis block, this is the very last block. And then there's the new reward. So what's well, mind like bending? Way- I I think even without this, the system's going to work incredibly well. Yeah. And each Satoshi that's mined at this period of time is going to be incredibly valued. Yeah. It's worth ten Which, minutes of the world's energy at the time, whatever that right. is. So I mean, you release fifty million times ten minutes of the world's energy. Yeah. And that's the notion that is kind of interesting. It's like this is like a like a, a nuclear bomb being detonated at a particular period of time, the unleashing of so much energy, kind of like Satoshi's coins being moved today. This would be like yeah. a fraction of that being moved in the future. Yeah. And it has, it's, the idea is designed to have a similar weight. So like, if you look at the network, right, let's say there's 300 million wallets on the network. The way that we determine like the emergent properties of those wallets would be one is their balance and then two of the balance that all these wallets have, like to say you want to see the most influential. So let's imagine Bitcoin as a protocol, this thing that lives digitally. Now, how can it affect the physical world, right? How can one key's movements on the Bitcoin network affect the physical world drastically? And usually every address is just normal. The way that addresses get attention is by their weight and their weight comes from their days destroyed. Which means if I have an address, you both, you and I both got 10 Bitcoins in an address. I haven't touched mine since 2009. You've touched yours yesterday. Now, when I move my coins, it's probably going to be someone on Twitter says, hey, coins just moved that haven't been touched since 2009. Those kind of things, right? You have all these sort of canaries in the coal mines that kind of do their thing. Um, And I think that is the thing that comes up with the network, which is the weight of coins. Like coins have a weight based on their days destroyed. That's why if Satoshi moves his coins, people go, coins that have not been touched in forever just got moved. And so looking at that, Satoshi's got like 3,000 or 4,000 days destroyed, um, meaning they haven't been moved for four or 5,000 days. And I think this will, by the end of it, it'll have like 45,000 days or something like that. So if Satoshi's coins don't move before then, they should be the heaviest on the network. But if Satoshi's coins move before then, or don't, if Satoshi's coins move before then, then this has a higher amount of days destroyed. But uh, if they don't move, then Satoshi's still got his crown. Good luck to him. <laughs> right. Such yeah, a savage. How, how good is it? Like, isn't it just cool? It's so like Batman, you know, like, you you can't it's like as a person i'm mortal but as a symbol i can't be destroyed and it feels like batman i'm like do you think the nsa created bitcoin uh i think it's in that echelon of quality like you know they made tour they've made nuclear warheads they are like people like to hate on them but dude they're the best technologists on the planet as far as i understand like and yeah, Bitcoin is in the category of the internet and Tor and the nuclear warhead. Like, it's that much of a technological breakthrough. We've never had anything before made by humans that doesn't stop. Like, that's weird to think about. Do you think then if they did make Bitcoin that they made it to be an, a... Like, do they make it because it was makeable or did they make it with the, the idea uh. of... It, well, look, here's the thing. If I was, if I was, if I was like prime minister or something, right? If I say I'm prime minister in Australia and we got a really shit currency, I'd be like, "All right, get the nerds. We need something new, guys. Our currency's toast." It's like, "What do you mean it's toast, boss?" It's like, "Dude, we're in so much debt. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. We've got to invent a new currency, digital gold." Okay, cool. I love it. Let's make this. So let's say that um, the US is the US government is Satoshi. Good luck to him. I'm like. People like to hate on governments, but I'm like, dude, they've made all the shit that I use. I use the roads. I use the, like, I use the hospitals and stuff. Like, I know they're not perfect, but I don't know. I've tried to run a company before and I couldn't control 35 or 45 people. It's hard enough, let alone running a country and you've got to control 100 or 300 million people, competing interests. Um, But yeah, I think for me, I'd be like, well, let's look at the facts. I've got a terrible currency that is 
burning a hole in the whole world really quickly and we keep making it worse, are we going to pay this back? Or is there an alternative where we could change systems entirely and not have to worry about it? Oh, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. Let's invent a really strong currency, Bitcoin. Okay, cool. We'll pile, we'll stockpile a ton of them to start with and then everyone can have a go. But we've always got the largest thing. So we, once again, they are the kings of the currency. So if that is the case, which it probably is, I think that is... You think wait, that, at, that the NSA created... Bitcoin. Oh, I think it's someone in that level, like uh, that level of orchestration. Uh, so you think it's a group effort? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, a thousand percent is a group effort. Like it'll be a team of people, uh, probably NSA, MIT, something like that. Like you can see where the origins of the the essence of what they were trying to build. You can see before it started on mm. the. It was there like are a, papers written, yeah. There are papers and there's a thing, there's a really interesting post by... I think I saw I that's why I brought it guy's, up. I think the guy's name is buzzed out um, or spaced out. And it was the idea was to create a game where it was like a word shadow game where I can give you a word, but the shadow of this word says another word. And that was kind of this back and forth that they were doing on these forums. And I think that essence or that like... Um, uh, principle of one word's shadow producing another word that can be interpreted. I think that was sort of the idea behind uh, the chain of things, like basically hashing and chaining thoughts together, like words that say two words with one word. I'll try and find this this link, but it's really interesting. But I think it's no one, I don't care who you are. I'm not an idiot, but no one is smart enough to understand money that well, unless you have a really big... Who understands problems the best? People that have the biggest problem. That I Nobody get. has thought about money to the degree that the right white paper was written. I don't care who you are. I know right. I know you haven't. You have not thought about it that much. You cannot right. think about it that much. And that's it, why I it's think- It's why Michael Saylor figured it out really quick because he had such a big problem to deal with. Yeah. Uh, a $500 million melting ice cube. And Dude, so, yeah, you know, literally. it gets magnified. I, I get that. And he's brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you go back to the government creating Bitcoin, I, I still see that as like almost I see it of two two minds. So mm -hmm. one mind is you got the the evil government who runs the fiat and they don't want anything to ruin that because they make all their, you know, and then, well, and that's, then you that's have the, the evil people within right. the government. And, and then so you got the white hat group within the government who doesn't have their permission, who releases this secretly and they're going to save the world. Yeah. But then you have sort of like, oh, the government is kind of good people and they realize their money's gone awry. And they're like, hey, the one way we could save our money is if we backed it with this digital gold. And in that scenario, I see them claiming the Satoshi coins after a while to back the dollar. Uh, it's the only reason I can see the, the larger government doing I, it. Because yeah. to release it without, you know, actually capturing the value they created just doesn't seem very governmental to me. Right. And that's why uh -huh. that's almost like the the clue is that they're someone's reserved a little something for themselves along the way. Now, right. they did that, it that's a clue. And of course, the other they did it honestly, be, they mined it all fairly. Right. Of course. Then the other clue would be the government doesn't know who Satoshi is. And the Which only is, people who could not, cover that's that not, up. I'm not, uh, when I say that's not possible, that's not possible. Right. There is no way on earth. No and I can tell you crumbs, exactly no how nothing. to do it. Open right. up, open up any file. Like, so everyone's got access, like not everyone, but all the governments have access to everyone's information everywhere, right? They've got right. years and years of online data. No right. worries. Search, search all. Show me the first time that the keystrokes Satoshi Nakamoto showed up on a computer. Cool. Now we can laser it in because someone had to type the white paper. You had to publish the white paper Everything leaves a trail. Like it's it'd be take you give me 15 minutes and I'd tell you who it was. Literally. The, it's the skill to not leave a trail to me is almost greater is. than the skill to put all of Bitcoin together, which combines all the skills of cryptography, yeah. computer science, yeah. multidisciplinary uh, understanding of the problem, philosophy, yeah. economics, Austrian, oh. all of it, uh, monetary policy, monetary history. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's unfathomable. Yeah. Um, so then how are people like private keys? Ah, well, because let's say, okay. Are you having a good day today, Cedric? How's your day uh, been? Good or bad? Uh, yeah. Okay. Not too bad. I'm okay. gonna say it's been awesome though. Today was awesome. Nice. 
Okay, today, okay, so let's say, uh, how are private keys like people? Because so much of our physiological state is associated with money because our because money is so affects so much of our physiological state where we can go what we can do things like that um you know you are your private key in a way where you are because you're just a number like we're all just a number like so don't trust verify so how would i verify that i'm talking to you i'd probably look for, or let's say satoshi nakamoto perfect example how do i verify satoshi is satoshi there's a lot of hand wavy ways that you can look at it. Like Craig Wright's tried to go, or you can just say, sign a transaction, sign it. That's all I want. You just cryptographically sign it and we're good. No worries. Okay, cool. It's a super easy, lightweight process. Okay, cool. So how are we all like prior numbers? Well, Satoshi only proves to me that he's Satoshi by signing with Satoshi's key, right? Like you can come up to me and say, Hey, I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. No, no, trust me, dude. Here, look at this. Look at this. I'm like, just sign. Just I'm over. There's too much noise. Just sign. To sign and I, I sign and you got me back. Otherwise, I'm going to rub one out or just play video games because I'm not thinking about this shit. And so, like, if you think about that, the way that Satoshi tells me he is Satoshi is by signing it with a key. And so his key is a prime number, rel or it doesn't have to be. It's relative. To, it's related to a prime number. In RSA cryptography, prime numbers, all prime numbers. So. If I am only who the cryptography allows me to verify myself to be, right? So Michael, your Cedric is not Cedric unless he signs with Cedric's key. Hey, Cedric, did you send me that? No, I didn't send you that. Well, it came from your wallet address. No, it didn't. Or, you know, like it is you if it came from you kind of thing. So the only way to prove you are you is cryptographically online. Like, because now with AI and deep fakes, voice, that's commoditized now. I can run through a hundred of your episodes, copy your voice and your look and regenerate a podcast that makes it look like you saying something. Now, obviously I'm not going to do that. I, I actually don't know how to, but I know it's, you can do it. Um, so now you are not you anymore. You just stop being you because everyone can look like you and everyone can sound like you. So now I need to find out what makes you, you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So how do I know that Cedric is Cedric and not just looks like and sounds like Cedric? So right now in the future, five years from now, you might log onto this Zoom. I said this to someone else, but it very likely in five years, if not less, I'm not even talking to you. You're in the pool sitting there on a, like a cocktail and I'm looking at the AI generated person with ChatGBT's engine to look like Cedric, sound like Cedric, and it's indexed all of your emails, your messages. And so it knows how you write and knows how you speak because it's indexed all your podcast. It can very easily regenerate you for me. So you might, I might be talking to you, but you're not there. And now the moment I go, can you sign me with your, can you prove it's you by signing with your private key? And then the chat GBT is like, ah, ah, uh, 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 you know, and now you've got to get out of the pool and come and put your headphones on and actually pretend to be here to make the actual signing of the private key. So how are we all like a prime number? Well, if the only way, if our primary form of communication is digital, that's the primary mechanism for us to transfer information, communicate with each other. And the only way that I can verify myself being real on that is through cryptography, then that sort of links humans and cryptography really tightly now. Um, because now on the internet, I could message you and say, hey, it's Mike. And you'd be like, okay, well, how do I know it's you? I need a sign from this wallet address or whatever. Um, you need to be able to prove it's Mike just beyond the cosmetic components, which we're going to take, we take this for granted now, the same way that we used to take photos for granted. So we used to love photos and then Photoshop came out and we're like, Ugh. the guy with 40 abs, the guy that jumped out of a building with no parent, like all these bullshit things come up and you start losing the value of photos because they're not precious anymore. There is a bullshit. Is it not? Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. The moment things become easy the moment they become commoditized and they lose value. So photos now used to be a beautiful thing. Now everyone's got too many photos they don't know what to do with. They don't take, photos aren't a, the idea of capturing a moment. It's almost just like to record the shitty things you do all day. Like, you know, the shitty, the boring life you live. Like we don't, we don't treat photos the same way we used to because they're everywhere now. So with Photoshop coming out, it made everything seem less, 
exciting. A photo wasn't exciting now. You know, seeing a photo of an alien spaceship wasn't exciting now because you think, oh, that's Photoshopped, right? Same thing. And so now we're going to say, oh, yeah, but you have no idea if that was him or not. It's like, oh, I was talking the whole day. It's like, you have no idea if that's real. Like, because right now you're just on the screen. Like, you're not real in front of me. So I can assemble pixels. Pixels are like in quantum. Quantum has a thing called super, in quantum computing or whatever they want to call it, quantum mechanics, they've got a thing called superposition, which is where a particle can be, let's say it's a one or a zero. It can be a one, a zero in both states. They, they try and make it all bullshitty and gatekeepy with this terminology. Think of it like a pixel on your screen, right? Your pixels all the way. And that pixel, it's not red, it's not blue, it's not black, it's not white. It's whatever you tell it to become based on what you're producing. That is what our universe is like. So when people say, uh, a quantum superposition or quantum particles that can achieve superposition, pixels. Just don't even overthink it, pixels. Oh, you mean it's something that can take the state of whatever its surroundings are? That's exactly what I mean. Oh, thank you. You didn't need to invent a new word for that, but okay. You know what I mean? So anyway, as we start understanding that we are just pixels on a screen, the weight of cryptography gets heavier and heavier because now... Um, cryptography becomes more and more needed if I can't tell if you're real or not. I need some work, the proof of work, which is cryptography, to generate that key. It put an electrical current through my computer. My computer had to spend energy to make it. And now I generated that key. That electrical current is the only proof of certainty that you have behind your side that I've done the work to be me. So that's why Zoom, you know, Zoom, we're, I mean, we're on Zoom now. You know, Zoom made an acquisition. They bought a company called Keybase.io. Keybase is basically, it was a tool that came out, an identity tool where you'd upload all your cryptographic keys to build, hey, this is me. This is my key. So it's like, you know, you've got your multi-sig of like five different keys on Casa or whatever it is. Same thing. And you basically upload saying, hey, this is me. If you get a signature from these keys, that means it's me. You see a lot of the developers in the Bitcoin community or open source community, they upload their PGP key to prove or whatever. They say, this is my key to prove it's actually me uploading this or doing this and not someone that's compromised my account as well. And so they do that to provide a super level of authenticity. And so now, now we're going to go through this world where you know the keys have all the weight, really. And so if the keys are just prime numbers mixed together, just like... You know, if I gave you the color purple and said, what did you mix together to make this? You'd say red and blue. If I give you the color green, what did you mix together to make this? I don't know, but I don't know the spectrum that well. But just like if I give you a public key, what did you put together to make this? Two numbers went in. We smooshed them together really hard. Um, and that sort of cryptography is just smashing two numbers together through an equation. Like for lack of a better thought, just like how when we were cavemen, two rocks, smash them together, a little spark flew off. That's the emergent property of putting something under such high pressure, something has to give. And that spark is the, imagine us sitting around a campfire, not even a campfire, sorry, we didn't even have a campfire, sitting around with our rocks in our cave and we're like, Ugh, and we smash it. It's like, and we think, what happens if I smash it as hard as possible together? Because this thing's unbreakable. And then sure, the, poof, this emergent property, a spark comes off. So what we're doing now in like civilization we're almost smashing technology together, which is making these emergent properties. Bitcoin is the spark after the banking system and printing money collided. Does that make sense? You've got a rock called the banking system, a rock called the money printer, smash it together, this tiny little spark. It was just a tiny thought, but enough weight, enough pressure of these two things that someone believes to be contradictory or ineffective or whatever they are, that tiny spark is that that glimmer of hope, it is possible. There is a chink in the arm. If you smash them together hard enough, some change of state occurs. And so that, I, I look at the white paper, like the spark after smashing two massive rocks together, um, a money printer and a banking system, and you smash them together, the spark that came off them was the white paper. Um, and so I think coming full circle, and I know this is a really, really long-winded roundabout way to answer your question, we're all becoming prime numbers. Now that I think, well, as we all become more and more the cryptography that we verify ourselves with, we lean more and more on that. So if you're not just your face online, so like right now to verify you, I can say FaceTime me and I see your face and it sort of seems legit and we're fine. But 
you know, like I couldn't ask for a recorded video. If Joe Rogan was my customer, I said, can you record a video saying you verify this, this, and this transaction? I'd have to do it live because I know it's too easy to make a fake Joe Rogan voice and a fake Joe Rogan face. Do you know what I mean? And so now I have to verify it through my eyes or cryptographically. I say, hey, Joe, that's cool, but I need you to sign a transaction from your account first because I just can't do this. I don't know it's you. And so what is real? I think that becomes a very big question soon. Um, and, you know, what is real? We start defining real as well. Uh, you know, numbers are numbers real now. Well, my private key is my only representation of myself because my face doesn't do it because everyone can look like me. Everyone can sound like me online because we can all copy each other now. So if everyone can look like Cedric and sound like Cedric, how do I know I'm talking to the real Cedric? I've got to get you, got to get you to sign a transaction or use some mechanism of work to prove it's you. Whatever that work is, is probably going to be agreed upon locally. Like you and I, I'll, with identity, right? When you verify anything, when I, when I verify you, unfortunately, this is one of the problems with identity, but the bonuses of numbers. Numbers are the only things in the universe that declare their identity. So number seven is number seven. Like, hey, I'm number seven. A flower is not a flower. A flower is just existing. We call it a flower. Like, the, But the flowers take the same shape. So numbers declare their identities. We assign identities to things. And so... For you, if you wanted to be you and you log onto this podcast and you're there and you look like you and stuff, you can tell me as much as you want that it's the real you, but it's only when I verify it, are you actually the real you? And here's what I mean by that. If I've got me and five other people standing in front of you or your best friends, and there's three Cedric standing in front of your best friends and they're like, you all look the same. You all sound exactly the same. You've got the same things in your pockets. You all got a copy of your driver's license. So there's no physical thing. I've got to get meta with it. And so now how would C all Cedric say, hey, yeah, we're all Cedric. And I'm like, well, you're obviously all not. So now my your five friends start asking the Cedric's questions. Hey, Cedric, what was that song you used to like and sing really loudly in the shower when you stayed at my house for ages? And it's like the first guy's like, uh, uh, John Bon Jovi living on a prep. Nah, that's not you. You're bullshitting. And so I ask you contextual questions that tethers the relationship between you and I together. And we can understand, I know that that is you and you know that that's me. No matter what you look like or smell like, it doesn't matter. I know that's him because he's the only person that knows these six different attributes spanned over 12 years of being friends. No one can bullshit that because I just thought of them right now. And he only knows them because we've been friends for so long. There's no calculated angle or anything. It's just general knowledge on the friendship and it's unspoken things. So that becomes interesting because now Cedric, if you're standing there with two clones, you might get picked wrong. If you don't know the question answers well enough, some the fake Cedric might win. Does that make sense? So it's quite yeah. scary now when you think impersonation. Well, I think the, the fake now. Cedric is 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 being poised to win now because if, if we're doing this on Zoom and so all the all the Cedrics are digital and not cloned yeah. like physical human clones, yeah. Then the, these uh, fake Cedrics have access to everything. Probably uh, the real Cedric wrote in an email or said on a phone, and so unless you've actually had in person experiential. Yes. Uh, contact with the, with yes. the real human it's gonna get really hard to figure out yep. because the fake and cedrics are gonna know a lot of real good answers they're, um, they're gonna know they're gonna have so much context yeah. like oh it's insane and, and, and they, depending on yeah. the nature of the conversation like i was talking about this with dave Collins, so it's like mm -hmm. it'd be hard to chat gpt him because when he goes he goes for four hours and that's yeah. a lot of extraneous uh conversation but uh, as the podcast host the chat GPT just has to figure out like 19 good questions from said. And so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if the nature is to be the host, it's a lot easier to not know if you're talking to the real person, if you're not challenging and, and you, and if you don't have the ammo to figure out who the real yeah. Cedric is, that that's, that's crazy. And then, yeah. so then thinking about like unlocking answers, then how, what is, you know, how, how would you kind of describe unified field theory and how Bitcoin fits into that. Yeah. Okay. So Bitcoin is a mixture. Bitcoin is the glue between physical and non-physical. 
because what we what it's done to us, it's shown us that the power of a non-physical piece of anything or entity, it's not nothing is real in Bitcoin. It's only made out of numbers, but it can have mind-altering effects, right? Like astronomically mind-altering effects. Um, that to me is quite fascinating. And so Bitcoin is sort of the glue because the thermodynamic proof of work is the physical component where it needs that electrical current on the grid sent through the ASIC to hit that proof of work mark of, you know, trailing 10 zeros or whatever for mining a block. Um, and so because Bitcoin is the glue between the non-real world of cryptography and the real physical world of thermodynamics, those are pairing a thermodynamic energy signature with a cryptographic energy signature. So, you know, when you say sign a transaction or, oh, send me the signature or there's a signature of this transaction, that's proof that they signed that at that time and they signed whatever it said. So whenever that happens, there's an electrical current. Like if we could see the earth and the grid, like almost like veins with electricity running around them, we could zoom in specifically to an ASIC computer that mined your Bitcoin or that mined your transaction that you submitted. So we could theoretically find who, who like what computer that spark existed through. So the spark, when it went, try this answer and it went tink and it won it, your whole world is connected to that spark. And so a unified field theory for me, I think cryptography is going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back for that. And let me explain what I mean by that, which is Bitcoin has brought a lot of attention to applied cryptography, right? It is a cryptographic system. That's what Bitcoin is built on, cryptography. We don't look at it like that. We look at it like money and talk about it like that. But at the end of the day, it built, it brought a huge amount of attention to a cryptographic distributed system. And now what I believe everyone's going to realize is that the relationship between cryptographic keys and them being just an intersection of two prime numbers, I think that is going to start teaching us to look at things that aren't cryptographic or aren't numerical with the same behavior, which is things are just a collision of two other things always, whether that's prime numbers, whether it is particles, like that's made up of, you know, uh, what is it? Carbon is made up of one hydrogen and one oxygen or whatever it is, two carbon. And you want to, you know, particles are made up of shit. They've got a, like recipes and stuff like that. Everything is made up of something else, basically. There's nothing unique. Everything is only the composition of things that came before it. So me, I'm only a composition. The maximum composition I can be is whatever my parents' DNA maximum range is. You know, we have a boundary on what we can and cannot do and be. Um, and I think basically the essence of what Bitcoin will do, it's going to teach everyone how to look and see things in a cryptographic way. Everyone knows what a hash function is now. Five years ago, that might not be the case. 10 years or whatever, maybe not the case. Now, everyone. So if everyone knows what a hash function is now, everyone's going to know about prime numbers in 15 years or whatever. Or And, and then in 20 years after that, everyone's going to know a solution to find those. But like times change. We're going to find solutions to these things over time. But one of the interesting things for me is like, you know, prime numbers right now, every single cryptographic key on planet Earth, bar none, are bound to the behavior of prime numbers. Now, what that means is basically like saying every single person on the Bitcoin blockchain is deriving their Bitcoin address from the same seed phrase. Does that make sense? Meaning if someone finds that seed phrase, that's problematic for every person on the network because their Bitcoins are being held by a wallet that controls that seed phrase. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's like a private key to the universe. So a, a seed phrase, when I've got a seed phrase, it's 12 words that I can derive a billion addresses from them. Now, let's imagine hypothetically that everyone that uses the Bitcoin network is using a wallet that is derived all from the same seed phrase. That puts everyone at risk at once from the same bit, this bit of information. If this exists, then everyone changes instantly. And that's now we look at look at that relationship between uh, a non-physical environment changing and a physical effect on everyone's keys. 
So basically what I'm saying is prime numbers are like the private key to the universe. They affect every particle and everything about that because they've got the tightest relationship with energy. This is my belief. This is not what Einstein's saying or anything like that. This is what I believe. And I, I'm happy to put as much money as I can afford on for someone to bet me to be wrong. But um, I wrote a white paper about it, basically saying that they're transitive in nature. So E equals MC squared is all the relation, all the equations for physical stuff. Anything in the universe, it conforms to that equation. And anything in the digital universe conforms to the equations of circles because we don't know, we always have three points when we produce any shape on a screen. We make them out of polygons. And so triangles are just a circle, basically. They've got three points. A circle has three points. They've got their radius, they've got their circle area, and they've got their uh, another constant pi. Um, sorry, I'm just moving here. Um and so I I think that we're going to realize that because the equations of physics are the exact same equations that govern geometry and trigonometry, basically these two systems have the same dependency. And when you have a dependency, it means you can never grow until that dependency is rid of. If you're an addict, like if you're addicted to, let's say, I don't know, ice, you to control that person, you just control the addiction, right? Like if you want them to do something, then you put the carrot, like it's a, the most exaggerated version of an incentive model is with an addict. Because if you're addicted to something, you're beyond your own personal control. Oh, that's the belief, right? So you're going to do stuff. So dependencies are what we are addicted to. Like generally we're dependent on them. That's why they're called dependencies. So the universe is dependent on prime numbers. Cryptography is dependent on prime numbers. That is going to be the link, in my opinion. Um, and so there's a connective tissue there that we don't really see day to day, but I think Bitcoin is illuminating that because Bitcoin is so pure in what it is. It's only proof of work and very consistent. It means it's like a laboratory experiment that everyone gets to observe all at once as a species. So imagine we created something as a species and in a lab and everyone got to look at this thing and how it grows and, and make their own notes. It's like an open source project lab experiment. I'd say Bitcoin is like that. It's an open source lab experiment where everyone is a scientist making observations. Um, there's no right or wrong on it either. That's the beauty of it. For the first time ever, there is no right or wrong because no one should give a shit because at the end of the day, Bitcoin is that is like, you know, there's a beautiful saying or like some really good writing. Like I think it was beauty on you said something about basically Bitcoin is, and that is enough. Like, as in it is, you finish the sentence. You don't ever need to because Bitcoin is and find you choose your own adventure. Bitcoin is for you. Bitcoin is for me, whatever that is, is <laughs> God, that's a bad sentence. I'm so shit with my diction. I need to get better at English. Do you think yeah. uh, Bitcoin has hypnotized you a bit? Has it changed oh, your consciousness? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Oh, I'd say it's almost unhypnotized me. It showed me the more real essence of things. Like most of the stuff I used to like, it was all junk that like no work had gone into it. It was all just uh, conditioning. I liked it because I thought I liked it, but I actually didn't like it. I'm just used to liking it. And Bitcoin kind of stalls the conditioning uh, in a way where you go, well, what work did they do for it? Because when you're in Bitcoin, you learn about incentives really quickly. You see all the other chains that try and kill Bitcoin and they all die really quickly because their incentives are all poisoned and tainted with someone getting an early special treatment or this, this, this. Some arbitrary personal creator's preference that ends up just fucking it all. And so that's taught you incentive models and taught me about proof of work and all this kind of stuff, which has made me think more about things in my life. What aren't I working for that I'm getting? And it's like, you know, oh, well, you're still healthy. It's like, well, everyone, we all take our health for granted because we got it for free. Things that we don't do the work for, we typically take for granted. And so as a human being, that's one of the things we need to get a warning sign when we come out and said, hey, you better work on your body as much as fucking possible, dude. Why? Why? Uh, why does it matter? Uh, let me tell you something, dude. You have no idea what price people would put on good health. And here's a, a really good saying, which is so true. You know, the rich man asks for 20 things. The, the dying man asks for one. And that's true. The sick person only wants to be healthy. The rich person's got a million and one things they want to do. But the sick person says, just give me my health back. I don't care. No Lambos, no dancing, no parties in Vegas. No. 
just my health, dude. This is the worst. You ever been so sick or so hungover or whatever it is that you're like, oh, you'd rather die. And you're like, I would, you can't even eat. Like if pizza is your favorite thing to eat, you're like, oh, no, nah, couldn't even. Your whole conscious state, your preferences. It's like you've uploaded a new file from a different person. It's like, oh man, you want a pizza? No, nah, oh, I feel like shit. Or, you know, when your body's feeling like crap, you've got a fever. Yeah, I love pizza. I love lasagna. But no, I ain't fucking having anything but water or flat lemonade and dry bread or something. Like nothing. I don't want to disrupt it. And that's kind of like, I can't remember where I was going with it. But um, yeah, anyway, that's a, uh, shit, what was I going? When you're sick, you don't want anything. Ah, because you know the value of stuff. Because you know what is valuable to you. Your priority gets very crystallized. Very, your priorities get very crystallized very quickly when health decays. That's why money changes our priorities because money is so high up the food chain of our thought process. It goes health and survival, or I call it security, but let's say health and survival. Am I dying? Like if my arm is bleeding out, I'm going to go to the doctor before I go to go to work. Work is the next priority. But if I don't fix this thing, I can't get to the next priority. So if I don't fix my arm, I can't start making money, but I need to make money to buy the things that I don't need, blah, 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 conditioning all the way down. So I think that that's a huge thing. Like, um, yeah, just, just understanding the relationship between work and outcomes. Uh, and it seems very obvious, but uh, you call me stupid, but that wasn't obvious to me. It was, I'd always known early ripe, early rotten. I'd always had a decent work ethic, but I'd never had it so illuminating on repeat. When you see we're doing this, chain fails, dies, shitty, blah, blows up, gets hacked. We're, we're changing this. Gets hacked, fucks up, dies, changes. Everything, ch like, it always just basically fails in comparison to just the OG. I do my work every time. I'm not the fastest. I'm not the happiest. I'm not the friendliest, but I'm the most reliable. And that's a thumbs up. That's all you need. Are you going to be there? Cool. Like, that's the time machine shit in the wormhole. The thing is, if you're building something for 120 years to look at, you got to know that the thing you're building it on is going to be there in 120 years. So people are like, oh, why wouldn't you build it on Ethereum? I'm like, why would I build it on Ethereum? Dude, they've changed like eight different things in three years. And I'm not against Ethereum. I'm against changing shit. That's why I'm just adding for this experiment, what I'm trying to do, it can't change. I've got to have a reliable uh, geology test and the geo geological test of the footing or the grounding that you're building whatever you are building on you can choose to use the second strongest or the strongest and there's no cost difference between the two i'll take the strongest because now i don't have to think if there's a stronger option out there uh i'm lazy though i like thinking about things in the what's going to cause me the least amount of headaches long term what what can you do now that solves it and you don't have to worry about it and that's what i feel like bitcoin does that with money like not instantly because instant is not real by the way and all this instant shit it's all fiat instant fixing instant pain relief instant no nothing that is instant is going to be beneficial i don't think usually even even yeah, beware of short-term pleasures like there's a saying beware of short-term pleasures especially in our world gambling drinking drugs sex alcohol whatever it is all of that stuff is you know, it's exhibiting the opposite of delayed gratification, which is it's instant gratification. You drink a beer, feel better. You swipe on TikTok, you feel relieved, but whatever, whatever your poisons are. Um, but I think just that delayed gratification that everyone is learning now, Bitcoin's not trying to be, oh, we do it in one second. And then Solana comes out and says, well, we do 20 transactions per second. And everyone's like, who gives a shit? Like this is, you're trying to fit the old broken fiat system on chain. That's not going to keep going. What People aren't going to keep buying 30 PlayStations and a new iPhone every year. You are a product in a system. People aren't going to go to the doctors three times a year to get the same shot. That's not going to happen. People are going to find natural, longer-lasting, persistent remedies. So instead of going and running 10 times a week, people are going to say, mm, maybe I'm actually just going to eat clean. And then that takes all the headaches out. I don't need to wake up an hour early before work. I don't, so for me, one of those examples, I don't drive now. I got, I still have a car, but I don't drive. So I walk everywhere because that has been like the freest trade I could do. It's like, okay, it's better for my health. I'm getting steps in. 
And it also means you have to be more organized because if you have to walk everywhere, it's like, you know, you're 40 minutes from anywhere. So everywhere you have to be very kind of, okay, this will take that long to get there. But if you're in an Uber, it's like, eh, it'll be about 15 minutes. I'll just whip there. I'll run late and whip there in Uber. But you've got to be organized. And I'm a very disorganized person by default. I'm just, some people were born, they know how to ride a bike, they know how to play table tests, whatever. I do not know how to be organized. I'm working on it as best of my ability, but I'm trying, but it's hard. But anyway, long story short is, uh, shit, I've forgotten what I was going to say. Organization, being I was being disorganized with my thoughts is a perfect example of how retarded I am. Great. Excellent. Look at this, by the way. I've got this really, I've got a new book the other day, a new Bitcoin book. It's good. I've got a couple to read, actually. I'm in the hole. You know when you build up your list of... I think I have that book. Um... Was that Dez's book? Uh, um... Dude, this is, yeah, this is Daz and Seb, Beers for Bitcoin. Oh, I don't have that one yet. That looks oh, dope. dude. Oh, you know what? It's the sickest. Oh, so I've got I got two books. I got Bears for Bitcoin, and then my brother got me Crypto Sovereignty by Eric Kaysen. Ah. And then I'm so pumped. I've only read like the beginning of both. I'm a terrible reader. I've got like dyslexia or some shit. But, uh, I got yeah, on I'm my uh, to-do list um, Broken Money by Lynn Alden is coming on next. And oh, uh, sick. Principles of Economics with Safety and coming on after that. So <laughs> my plate is full. I only get to read How books. smart are some of these people? Oh, like, ridiculous. This is like Lynn Alden or Safford. I'm like, how do they think about, like, how can, what What did you do in your life to accumulate this much of knowledge on something? Or like, oh, man, it's so cool. I feel really lucky. Actually. Well, they might like, say the same like, about you. Nah, dude, no, nah, I'm, dude, I'm retarded at that. So I don't know. That's you know what it is. It's just curiosity. Whatever you're curious in, you can keep walking the journey for. If you're not curious, like you know, I used to work at McDonald's or Baker's Delight, like a bakery, right? You go there, and it's like, look, it feels like a six-hour shift when you're doing a six-hour shift because you don't want to be there or whatever. But if you're there, like you spend six hours reading through shit on, you know, Twitter and you go download some new information, you read a book, you like, you feel like you're filling up your cup of knowledge because you're so passionate about this stuff. And that's why you see the passionate ones survive and the people that aren't passionate won't because passion is like, you know, like if you, if you're motivated to go to the gym, that's cool. It's a bonus. But if you're disciplined to go to the gym, that's sure as certainty. So motivation is like a flash in the pan, almost like a steroid, like a like a quick boost, pick me up, like a Red Bull. But you can't rely on, oh, I need my Red Bull to get out of bed. So you need discipline. And so I think Bitcoin's taught me a lot about just the, the power of discipline and why it's, you know, being principled and stubborn and not bending uh, towards other things. I think that's, Bitcoin's taught me heaps about that. Um, yeah, it's a constant tuition game. We're all learning. It's just... We're all trying, I think it's just a case of trying to learn as fast as possible and trying to stay excited about it. If you're not excited and passionate, and I've seen it a million times, whether it's team members that I've worked with personally or it's developers that I've worked with, a lot of people come for the money and they cannot stay because you are going to eat glass. That is a promise. This is the third or fourth bear market. And I'm telling you, you will eat glass and you better get enjoy eating glass because the more you enjoy it, I've got plenty more bear markets coming up for you, dude. So if you love this bear market, you're going to love the next 10 that I've got coming for you. Or we could go hyper Bitcoinization and we've got no more bear markets. That's something I think here's, here's an interesting thing. I think that big I think that there's a chance that Bitcoin Bitcoiners will pay off the government debts. Mm. I know that sounds weird. So let me tell you something. So just like I've time locked the bitcoins into the future really far, right? What if I listed out every single country, right? So there's however many 187, 184, whatever it is, 206, I don't know. Every single country, their name and the amount of debt they're in. Right. So let's take the entire world's countries and the entire world's debt and let's basically find a trade, get every country and say, hey, guys, here's the trade. We'll time lock all the money that you guys have lost and we'll time lock it into the future. You give us the key that unlocks it. I don't need to know the private key. That's up to you guys. But we're going to pay these back. You will get them. These are released in 30 years and it'll be at a relationship of one dollar for every 100 Satoshis. So basically, that is you get the price of the total debt, mm. convert that to a hundred to one ratio, where a hundred sats equals one dollar, 
And then the whole world switches over to a Bitcoin standard. And then the way that you tax everyone, everyone's mining by this time. So you go, great, we're going to do what Iran does. Iran, smart central bank, they basically 5% of the network's hash rate of Bitcoin is in is coming from Iran or 3.8%. You know, the Iran central bank takes a cut. They, they must, they must be the first buyer on offer from miners. So if I mine Bitcoins to sell them, I don't go to a Coinbase to sell them. I go to the Iranian central bank and sell them. So they're the buyer. They're the foot. You must sell them to the central bank. So now imagine every central bank around every country was incentivizing every person to mine and strategize about how to mine Bitcoin as efficiently as possible. Because the only thing, the only labor that we do now, we've got machines that can do everything. They can cook, they can clean, they can everything. We need to figure out energy and Bitcoin. And so I think that the whole world will switch to a Bitcoin standard. Um, it would be easier if we could get like every president or prime minister in one room and say, guys, this is the trade. Get ahead of it. Like, that's it. Because other than they will all be superpowers, everyone will be. And what's better is that everyone will be on one ledger, on one currency, speaking one language with one unified telephone. You can't have a unified field theory if you can't communicate it to one in one language and everyone to understand it. Because that means that you're not unified in your own right because you don't have one language to communicate it to. You don't have one system to upload, upload it to. If you find a solution, we do. We've got the internet. And you don't have one place to record it, what we do now. So now we are ready as a species for a unified field theory. We're not ready for it when we don't know what day of the week it is and all this stuff. We need a unified ledger that can't be stopped by us because unified field theories are big stuff and they can probably stop a lot of things and we're trying to avoid that. Um yeah, I, th I I really think Bitcoin is going to take physics to the next level. Um, you know, Nikola Tesla said that numbers were real and alive. And he felt, I think, at least understanding, he's saying that numbers exhibit certain behaviors that are emulated in the galaxies and all that shit. So basically, you see the swirl of a galaxy, you see the swirl of a seashell, you see the swirl of a rose, all of it is behaving on the same behaviors. It's just at larger scale, whether it's that big, whether it's that big, whether it's the size of a galaxy, everything is rotating and falling towards something, which um, whether you're a number or you're a person, but yeah, anyway, dude, I feel like I need to give you a Red Bull. You're falling asleep <laughs> over there. No, I'm not falling asleep. <laughs> I'm joking. If you could uh, orange pill anyone in the world, who would it be? Um, if I could orange peel anyone in the world, who would it be? Um, who would it be? Shit. Who who needs to be orange peeled is a better question. Um, it doesn't have to be someone famous. I mean, it could be personal, but no, if, I it, think it could be someone to change the world too, or whatever you want. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to think. I think it'd be uh. It would be someone with a tremendous voice and audience. Like, you know, if Tom Brady was speaking about Bitcoin, that would be exactly on brand for Tom Brady. The best, doing the best, talking about the best. You know, that that's the stuff I like. I like to see those people because there's not a lot of, I don't believe there's many role models for young men at the moment. Like there's not more, there's more coming. Like, you know, you're getting more louder voices and stuff, but haven't been great role models. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe it's just me, but I just feel like there's, there's not a great example out there, but I feel like, yeah, to be someone with a lot of influence that could help get the message far and wide. Um, I feel like, you know what, the, the people that are orange pills, like the Argentinian president candidate or prime minister candidate, or whatever, it'd be someone like that in those sort of shoes, because I don't think the people in power, are not, not the power, like the central bankers, you know, let me tell you something. And for anyone listening out there on Twitter, you're not the first person to know that they're doing it wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like, as in, you're not the first to think that they're idiots for printing money that way. They don't think they're idiots. They know they've got the finger on the button of fucking dreams of life. Like, they get it. You're not the first person to notice it. They're not not understanding you. You're missing the bigger arc of the story. And that's what I see, like, all this stuff. So... So, yeah, I think it'd be someone that's got their finger on the button. Uh, I wouldn't go that route. I'd go the route of the up and coming, uh, you know, president elect. I'd say like, you know, I like the Robert Kennedy 
uh, junior. It's a mindset. You've got to give half a fuck to think that something might be better than what the world currently is. And that half a half an energy, um, half an energy, half a, um, that, that tiny step leap of faith or leap of open-mindedness, um, it, it pays dividends to the nines. Like I thank my whole existence that Bitcoin is around now. And it's like, Oh my God, that was only because I was like, Oh, what is that? You know, like, and not like, Oh, that'll never work. Um, so if I could orange pill one person, I'm just, I don't even know. I feel like all the good ones have been orange pilled. Who hasn't been orange pilled? Like, is there someone sitting there that needs to get orange pilled? Yeah, I think the only people you would name there are the people who are obviously not going to get orange pilled. You yeah. know, the, the people that it would just it doesn't fit the script. And when I mean by yeah, the script, I mean script. it doesn't yeah. script their own values, it doesn't fit their own way of looking at the world. Yeah. But of course, if we were to orange pill President Joe Biden, that would be have a lot of impact. But it, he's not going to be orange pilled. Nah. You know, it just nah. doesn't fit like who he is probably in his life right now and, and yeah. what money represents and stuff like yeah. that. And and I, another thing is, you know, everyone is everyone has a different life to live. And this is important to know. So it's like all these like, you know, if you work at the government and you're really corrupt, let's say, good luck to you. You're playing the game. Everyone is playing this game. Not, the, the only thing we all have in common, none of us asked to be here. I didn't ask to be here. You didn't ask to be. And so when I see people that are taking advantage of the system, like that, are, let's say they're printing all this money and stuff, it's totally fucked. But right. it only happens because you let it happen. Right. Like, well, they the didn't is also through. not about credentialism. Mm. That's that's sort of the flaw in the question is that. Yes. You know, so it's like almost like a trick question. It's like, who do you want to see? Who do you think has the most power in the world to influence people? Mm. And, uh, you know, there is something uh, to be said of, you know, there's you get touched by Bitcoin three times usually. Yeah. So it's the idea. The notion is if this person speaks about it, that could be a touch. On mm. the other hand, it's don't trust, don't, you know, don't trust verify. So, like, why mm. should I trust someone if they speak of it? Um, and then well, there's the personal the side. Of it. Yeah. 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 Don't trust verify. You know what we're talking about when Cedric doesn't become Cedric from your look and your sound. The only thing that makes you, you is your work. So whatever that be, and this is why people put so much as we start realizing now, because before the internet, we couldn't duplicate ourselves. So we never had any verification issues on personal identity. We never had identity issues. Um, after the internet where I can be a 20, like you can be everywhere and you can duplicate, copy, paste yourself, Photoshop yourself, whatever it is. After that, we have identity issues. So now we need to figure out things like identity and purpose. But if we look at back at all the days, like Michelangelo and all these cats, their work spoke for them. Like they were, don't talk to me about it. That's my work. Don't, it doesn't matter what I think. The work is whatever you think it is, but it's mine. And you know that no one else did that. Whether they look like me and sound like me, you know they're not me because that's what makes me me. Only I can, like, only I can do the work. And so it becomes now a verification thing of you saying that's his work. Just like when we see a post and someone says that's Satoshi and they say, oh, yeah, it's Satoshi. It's like, that's not Satoshi. You know, like we find, we know these, like if Satoshi was to post again, we would all dissect it to the nines to figure out is that him or not him. So now everyone's work is far less purposeful because we've been running this sort of fiat race and no one had any identity issues. When everyone has an identity issue and everyone can be looked the same and sound the same, everyone starts looking in the mirror being like, fuck, what am I actually going to add that? Like, what am I going to do with my life that adds value? Like Michelangelo, these sculptors, they built shit out of marble because one, it's the hardest proof of work. Like it's like the strongest foundations to build on. If you want something to last a long time that's purposeful, we're going to have to build it on strong foundation. Just like building our house, a geologist, building, checking the groundwork, same thing. And like that's why they carve these beautiful marble sculptures or build these beautiful cathedrals. They're a proof of work and pride in this is what we are capable of. And so now when everyone looks the same and sounds the same, We've got to start looking and saying, well, what's your work? And people's work will be the way that we measure people and not by the, the look or the sound of their voice or the color of their skin, but only purely by their work. And we start building this relationship between 
your work that you do and your electrical current. So we sort of see past the veneer of, you know, face, eyes, nose, color, skin, blah, blah, blah. And we just think, your mind, my mind, our work, and we just work, and that's it. Like no one knows what Satoshi Nakamoto looks like. Like no one knows what they, who they are, whatever. But every person, if they could have the chance, they would say thank you to them. Here's a great example. These are published authors, and the first person that almost every person thanks in these things, acknowledges. Satoshi Nakamoto always gets, always gets, and always gets a look in. Let's so say here, crypto sovereignty. The first person thanked. Yeah, I'd just like to thank Satoshi Nakamoto. Like, and no one's met them. They don't know what the color of their skin. They don't know if they tell shit jokes. They don't know if their breath stinks. They don't know if they fart at dinner parties, but they love them. And isn't that weird? It's like a lost in translation moment where the whole world is falling in love with the same person or has a debt of gratitude to this person, but they've never met them. And it just proves to, sh- goes to prove the whole point. Like, no one gives a f- everyone sees past everything and everyone wants to see what work are you doing? What like what value are you adding in general? And so people can't deny the value that been, has been added by Satoshi. It's too real. And so now I think but Satoshi did a great thing by challenging us all to think bigger. Hey, I'm going to disrupt. It's not like he was building it. Let's call it a startup. And it's like, oh, what are you doing? Oh, we're going to make cloud infrastructure way more efficient. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, we're going to make it really easy to upload photos to social media. Oh, cool. What are you doing? Changing the definition of money. What? You can't do that. It's like, oh, I'm going to try. It should work, but I don't know. Like now every entrepreneur in my head, I, the first thing I thought was like, fuck, what am I here? I'm an idiot building some random thing. For, I'm like, you, I didn't know that was like on the table. Like I didn't know we could change the definition of a whole word forever. That's like, that's like next level. And then that got me thinking about like people like Einstein and Satoshi where Einstein's built a startup and his startup was just a really small startup, very lightweight, but it was a startup. It was E equals MC squared. Now it wasn't a digital company that did SaaS software. It didn't have servers and clients. It was like, here's, it's just like someone writes a book. He wrote a book. It was just a very short book. It was only that long. E equals MC squared. He has 8 billion customers. 8 billion users of his open source product, which is an open source equation. And so if you think about that as an entrepreneur, that, and like people like, you think entrepreneurs like mad, oh, Elon Musk, cool, bought Twitter, oh, cool. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the real cats, discovered countries, like, you know, Einstein broke mass equations. Uh, You've got all these people that are so, they name cities after them. They name, you know, that kind of level of stuff. Everyone has the power to be that person, the Michael Jordan of X, whatever that X is, that X is your choice, but you are a super, you have a superpower. We all do. We, the problem is not all of us get to find it. So these anomalies are where they've ever been forced into it or they've accidentally tripped over their sort of their purpose, let's say. Great example is like Venus and Serena Williams. Do you think they were born good tennis players? No, they were bred. Like it's literally, it's said the parents wanted to have kids that would grow up to be fantastic tennis players. So is that destiny? Not really. It doesn't look like destiny to me. That looks like hard work. Um, Yao Ming, the basketballer, used to play for the Houston Rockets. So Yao Ming was bred as well. Like it's, not, and I say bred, I don't mean in a disingenuous or unheart kind way. I mean it just as in a strategic way. Like, hey, th- we've got a plan of attack. Let's go. Um, but that was like the tallest general in the Chinese army and the tallest female basketball player were put together to have children. And Yao Ming was one of the children and he grew up to be an exceptional basketball player that could penetrate the minds and hearts of the West and become a fantastic spokesperson for China. And I thought it was rad. I loved it. I thought Yao Ming was sick. So I've always been a big fan of that shit. But anyway, all this stuff, uh, purpose, um, you know, no one is good at things. We we find our purpose. It takes time and there's so much noise. So I always think back to about how lucky people were in the olden days. People think, oh, it'd suck. Imagine having to go back to the year like 1800. And it'd be like, yeah, what? And no advertising, no phone blowing me up, all that shit. And I can, I've got time to think to myself and I can see all the stars because there's no smog and barely any pollution or whatever. Like, 
That sounds like a pretty good trade. And so I actually think, CG, I reckon we're, <laughs> sorry, no I reckon we're on track to be labelled as the stupidest version of humanity that we've ever seen. No other version has been this dumb, like with this many own goals. We eat ourselves to death and we're poisoning ourselves with pharmaceuticals to death and we're fucking our money. Like, no, there's been no more aggressive divisive behaviour. Even when Genghis Khan and there was wars around, here's the thing about like killing someone versus slowly killing someone. Uh, I think it was Marcus Aurelius or someone, Caesar said, you can find a million, you can always find people that are willing to die for you, but you can't find people that are willing to suffer for you, right? Suffering is hard. If you ask me to take a bullet to the head, I can't remember it. So it's probably like, eh, yeah, okay, how much money am I getting or whatever? But if you ask me, dude, I need you to get, you know, cut on the arm everywhere on the body once every one minute for 500 days in a row, I'd be like, fuck out of here. I'm not doing that shit. Like, fuck you. Find someone else. But that's the essence of suffering, right? And, you know, if I look at a tool, and uh, a weapon, I would say that suffering looks like temperature control. And if I look at an economy, like if I was in a room and it got really hot and it kept getting really hot, I'm suffering, right? That's like a sauna. And if it keeps getting hot and I can't leave the room, it's really apparent. And I get, I'm going to get hotter faster about because now my mind's racing, right? That's what inflation is without Bitcoin. It's like a sauna with a temperature. You have no control over the temperature. Someone is standing outside with the temperature dial, touching it, and they're just turning it up. Now, as they're turning it up, everyone is getting hotter and more flustered and more paranoid. Oh, hey, when are they going to let us out? Whew, oh, you're getting a bit warm. Everyone starts it. Now people's minds are starting to race. That's what inflation is. So killing people, not killing people, but just torturing them through inflation, where now you're making me become a hedge fund manager because... I only earn a hundred grand a year and I can't afford to live by myself. Like now I've got to become a hedge fund manager. Fuck out of here. That's ridiculous. You can't have a society. And it's almost like you're trying to create customers of gamblers or something. Like it's just, oh, it's silly. But anyway, I just think, uh, yeah, I think we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work to do, but we've all, we, it's very hard to think we need as much clarity of thought right now as possible. And that only gets more because, as the population grows and as things more energy starts getting utilized, everything becomes exponentially more important. So every decision becomes exponentially heavier, which means we need to have more clarity of thought the further up the, you know, further along time we go, but we're getting less. See, now people don't have much coherence in their thoughts. Like case in point, replay this video, you watch how terrible and scatterbrains I always am. Like I pull one thread and then I jump to another thread, then I forget where I am. But there is so much noise today in every way. People try to sell you stuff and all that stuff. You don't have a chance. Like people don't have a chance to find their purpose, what they're good at, all this stuff. Even weirder, if I was a magic genie and I gave you a wish, anyone, any person listening to this, if I came here, I go, magic wish, you tell me the number of money you want. Okay, cool. You're cool. You are $100 million. Great. Thank you very much. You got four years. Well, I'm going to come back after four years and I'm going to say, what are you going to do for the next 40 years of your life? Let's say you're 40 years old. You're going to live to your 80. Cool. You don't have to worry about money. You've just gone and partied for three years. You've done everything you've ever wanted, spoken and seen everything, tried every bicycle, Virgin Galactic, whatever it is. We have 40 years left here. Now what? It's like, oh, fuck. Now what? Yeah, I've got 40 years left. What am I going to do? Start contributing, bro. We don't need you to build more. We don't don't need you to make more money. We don't give a shit about that. Like money's like a scoreboard. I saw this really good thing where it's like, if you get to a billion, if you become a billionaire, like you should receive a medal, like saying, congratulations, you finished capitalism and now go do something else with your life. And I was like, that's so true because you, nothing else can happen. But now if money's out of the way and you've got 40 years left, your whole life just started because you've never had a pure thought for yourself until you don't have to think about money or health, like a sick person. How clear can a sick person's thoughts be if they're going in for chemotherapy once, twice a day? Like, obviously, they can find clarity, but you know that they've got a lot on and you can't expect them to have the best version of themselves and their thoughts producing because they've got cancer. You're like, dude, I don't care what the balance sheet thoughts are. you got cancer, man. Just deal with that. As where when you don't have cancers and stuff like that, it's like, well, if you're not sick, you got all the money in the world, you got all the time in the world, 
you have no other choice but to find yourself. You won't, the universe won't let you do anything because you get so bored with everything. If you haven't killed yourself from ODing on drugs in the party phase, you're going to come back here, you're going to be bored as fuck, and you're going to be like, wow, it really starts now, you know? And that's like, I, I find like, yeah, that's that's a thing. But I feel like a lot of Bitcoiners and a lot of people in, in the Bitcoin space will go through that because it's just the rate of return of Bitcoin and its its trajectory. It is it is intellectually dishonest to say it is not the best performing asset and will be the best performing asset ever. It, it just feels intellectually dishonest. What? Who on earth is going to argue with me? Like step up to the plate and say, you mean to tell me you've got your finger on the button and my button is untouchable and it's predictable and you're telling me your your money is going to outlast mine? Nope, not guaranteed. I'll stand here and wait. You'll fall over and die before it happens. Like it's so terminally ill to to speak to it is disingenuous it's misleading like it is misleading if i was a financial advisor and i told you know a 20 year old kid to save his money and put it in the bank i would feel like i'm doing them a disservice genuinely disservice because i know there's certain there's certain things that are going to happen bitcoin supply is not going to inflate and this other supply will inflate now, what rate of change it is, I don't know, but it will change. So those two absolute certainties, I think, are worth uh, worth worth thinking about. Um, yeah. Shit, I feel like we've covered a pretty broad spectrum. I um, think so. You know, yeah. it, it seems like there's a bit of a war on sanity these days. And Ooh. so my final question to you then is, uh, how are you spending your time? these days oh, i'll tell you exactly it, how is, it, is it just counting steps counting steps so my goal is so between one halving which is two hundred and ten thousand blocks um i came back from america three years ago and uh like you know in maybe three months or whatever it's the fourth year now the fourth year it's like um I've done, that's 210,000 blocks. So one halving cycle to one halving cycle. And my goal is to hit 21 million steps walked between that halving cycle. So that's a uh, hundred steps per block or one step every six seconds for four years straight, basically. And I was like, okay, that's cool. I can see that. I could do that. And that's been really good for clarity of thought as well. Like clearing my head. I'm trying to exercise way more. So like, I can't have new thoughts if I'm not putting my body under new pressure, like in whatever the pressure is, like just walking down a different street or doing a different endurance event or something, but you got to put your body into different states to find different thoughts. Um, I think I imagine like we've all got every thought in our head, kind of like having a brick of marble. We've got every statue possible in that brick of marble. We just, how we choose to find it and what we're choosing to find is a bit different, but um yeah that's awesome uh are you, are you in sydney i'm because, in sydney uh, i love sydney i was there about dude when, when, when are you coming come let uh, me know when you're here i would love to come back i was there 20 years ago yeah uh, i kept extending my time each day yeah. um it's probably my favorite city outside of new york city and new york, i mean i grew up outside of new york city so i'm biased there but Sydney oh, was well, like you got to come down for Bitcoin Alive next year. Uh, I would it was love to. Absolutely banging, mad event. We had it was really fantastic. True story. Not even being biased, it was a really good event. And I have a feeling. I think as you tweeted about, you're near Bondi Beach. You walk there a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. love it. Best. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. It is. Um, it is really, really nice. Yeah, I mean, I just enjoyed all parts of Sydney. Uh, yeah, wonderful city. People are nice. The the pace of Sydney is nice in that it's quite. People developed. can be rough. Like, they like to, uh, Australians like say. to give Americans a hard time, and I was on my own. I was, I was about myself. to say if you're not if so, you're not a, yeah if you're not acclimatized to the banter, you probably feel insulted. Oh, like, I could deal with the banter, but I was alone and by myself, so is I'm outnumbered, and, and the banter is louder than my replies. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> Well, but I hope they weren't giving you a hard time. It was still a good time. They weren't telling to fuck off. They'll be like, hey, beautiful. Well, I was also traveling. Uh, oh, so this was yeah. uh, probably tw 2005. Oh, so nice. right after Bush was reelected. So every Australian hated the fact that I was from America, even though. Oh, yeah. It, okay. You know, it was, it was during that kind of climate. So nah, I had yeah, a great yeah. time and most people were great. And, yeah. you know, uh, not everyone wanted to talk about politics. And I, I traveled from Sydney up to Cairns. 
um, oh, from Cairns. Sick. I took a boat up to, I think, like Port Douglas is it called to go out yeah. to the Barrier Reef. Yeah. yeah. I the spent best. about a month in the country. It was it was awesome. Oh, man. Well, next um, time you're back, beers, food, we'll hang out. It's, yeah. I'd love to show you around. Sick. I'd love to go the other direction, see some Melbourne and uh, ah, Ayers it. Rock. Okay. And, <laughs> what is There's the a rivalry right between Sydney and Melbourne, so I hear. I'd like to see Perth. Um, Dude, same. I'd like to see Perth. I'm stinging to go to Perth. I've never been. You know, it's funny. People are like, oh, you haven't been to Perth. It's, it's funny. Just... So I went from San Francisco to Australia, actually. That was, I moved. Direct. I was living in San Francisco and yeah. then moved, went to Australia for a month before moving back to New York. Yeah. But yeah. Because yeah. Australia is like 86 or like 78% the size of America. I think it's in the 80s. So that's what was really interesting. I saw Australia as like, uh, it's like an American project, like 100 years behind. Not that it's an American colony, it was more of a British colony, oh. but like, you know, yeah. so I would go to like somewhere like um, Byron Bay, and I'd be like, "This is San Diego in 1902." Yes, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I loved Byron Bay. Um, I think I, I I went to Byron Bay, Byron's Bay, Byron Bay, and I skipped Service Paradise or whatever it's called because I heard it was like Miami yeah. and just a bunch of tall buildings and clubs. Yeah. So. So it's about about so Australia's about eighty percent the size of the U.S. landmass. Uh, oh, it's about one. Oh, and less than ten percent the population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, our concentration like, is like we. It's like in pretty four cities. Um, it's like Sydney, now, Melbourne. Melbourne's not nearly Brisbane. that full. Yeah, which makes yeah. it just wild. I mean, it's just it's so much room to grow. Yeah, um, there's heaps. There's plenty of room to grow for sure. Um, but it is it's decent. I feel biased, but it, look, it is good. And you know what? Uh, it's hard to get to. So one of the funny things is it's hard to get to, which means you've got to do, a, there's a lot of work to get here. So the proof of work, once you show up, you know, you can't come here and be like, oh, I don't like it. And just be like, oh, well, let's see, let's hop over to Spain and then go to France. Like, right. nah, if you don't like it. So I was on a like really a three month journey. Way. I went to Australia. Well, I stopped in Fiji first and spent like uh, three weeks there. And then yeah. a month in Australia and a month in New Zealand. Beautiful. Uh, so. Well, look forward to having you back. Whenever you come back, let me know. Can't wait, mate. This was so dope. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate you having me. And uh, like I said before we started, I appreciate the bedtime stories I've been listening to. (laughs) That's awesome. I love that. Well, let us know where people can find you and your work. Uh, On Twitter, it's Michael Dunwert1. So there's no H in it, which is quite difficult. Um, but and then on GitHub, it's Mike D123. Um, yeah, that's if you want to follow you, feel free to buzz me, feel free to insult my work, do whatever. It's all G. Open, open season. So uh yeah, other than that, thank you very much for having me and thanks for taking the time. Appreciate it, Cedric. Thank you so much. It's been dope. I mean applause. Cheers.